Hello, everyone, and welcome to this moment to talk about the economy and recovery through the lens of the New York, New Jersey Harbor and Waterfront. I am Courtney Worrell, President and CEO of the Waterfront Alliance, and I'm thrilled to kick off our regional symposium on recovery and resilience in a new era. It is a new era indeed, one in which a global pandemic has wrought so much damage nationwide and around the world. It has exposed social, political, and economic risks that have been brewing for some time. Our harbor, our waterfronts, our green and blue economy will have a central role in recovery. They must have a central role if we are to build back better, stronger, fairer, and smarter. These are the topics our presenters will explore today. It is the mission of the Waterfront Alliance to make sure the harbor and waterfront, which make our region what it is, and, that they, and yet they are often not seen, that they are highlighted and integrated into all of our regional priorities. I'd like to now acknowledge our 2020 conference sponsors, whose support of the Waterfront Alliance culminates today. Our sponsors have helped us reach over 1,000 people in 2020. And a special thank you to our top level sponsors, Equinor, Con Edison, Red Hook Terminals, AECOM, and New York City EDC, along with our other conference sponsors. Thank you all so much for being a part of this important work and bringing this message to so many people in 2020. We will be hearing today from Lindsey Green of the New York City Economic Development Corporation on recovery and a major victory for renewable energy in our harbor that was announced yesterday by Governor Cuomo. And in the audience today, we are so pleased that Con Edison Waterfront Scholars, joining us from colleges and universities across the region, can join us. Thank you, Con Edison, for making this possible. And now I'd like to turn it over to the chairman of the Waterfront Alliance, Chris Ward. Welcome everybody. It's, it's really my pleasure to welcome you to this important symposium. Many friends have joined us again today. Um, we have a fantastic array of sponsors. Let me acknowledge the wonderful news at Equinor are received yesterday in the, the governor's commitment and the commitment for a clean energy future. Um, when I was thinking of my remarks today though, um, I sort of threw out what I had earlier prepared because I would like to pose a challenge to the whole group. And the, the challenge is that as we have just seen, as Courtney mentioned, this country's ability to politically understand the scientific challenges that we have going forward um, is simply unaligned. Um, and the uh, environmental movement and the response to climate change, the science, the science is well known, just as we saw with the, the pandemic. But the political language around that science is not resonating throughout this country or even throughout the world. And I pose it as a challenge to all of us who are part of this conference today, like all movements going back to the civil rights movement, the anti-war movement, we must begin to find a common language and dialogue that connects politically with our constituencies, that makes clear the challenges and sets forth an agenda this country can finally embrace to address far too often what is only referred to as an existential challenge, which I reject because it is not an existential challenge, it is a challenge that is fundamentally before us today. And without political action, without local response, without city response, without state response, and without a fundamental political language which binds us all together in common commitment, we will not meet this challenge. So today is, is really about this community beginning to develop throughout the city um, a language and a political conversation that gets us to the point where we begin to scientifically respond to the challenges that we truly, truly face. This past week, there was an absolutely stunning summary from 150 scientists around the world collating all of the environmental data and the challenge they posed was simply one of worldwide devastation and if we cannot find a political framework and a language to address this challenge i deeply deeply worry about our future so i start with that challenge to all of us i thank you all for coming here today it's an important um 
gathering. It is a gathering that must be replicated throughout um, this country and throughout the world. And hopefully it is the start of a political movement um, that brings real change, not only to New York City, but the United States and the world as a whole. So I would like to leave you with that challenge and we'll be back shortly. Great, thank, thank you, Chris, so much. So now we're gonna get on with the program. So we're gonna be hearing from our elected leaders. That includes, I mean, so these are the joys of working from home. <laughs> we're gonna be hearing from Congresswoman Grace Meng, Congressman Donald Payne, Jay Christian Bolich, who's the mayor of Elizabeth, New Jersey, and New York City Council member Costa Constantinidis. And now I'd like to turn it over to Representative Meng. Thank you so much for being here. and We're so glad that you're safe. Thank you so much, uh, Courtney. I hope you guys can hear me. Uh, I'm Congresswoman Grace Meng from Queens, New York, and it's such an honor to join you all uh, at today's uh, Waterfront Alliance's uh, Nat Regional Symposium on the future of our region and what our federal government and colleagues can do to help strengthen it. Uh, thank you to Courtney, to Chris, uh, my friend Karen of the Waterfront Alliance for inviting me to share a few words. Um, and I also wanna recognize my colleagues, uh, Representative Payne, Mayor Bolwich, uh, Council Members Brandon and Constantinides. Um, hope everyone is safe and healthy. Uh, obviously, this has been a really trying week for our country, uh, including us here in Congress. Um, and I hope that you all continue to stay safe uh, and healthy. We really, um, this last week, we were all witness to the siege on the symbol of democracy in our nation's capital. Last week's violent insurrection uh, was an, insult, an assault on the people's house. Uh, I've never felt more enraged uh, and terrified in my life. Um, I really feel like the people's house um, is a place for you know everyone from young kids, our kids, to, to new immigrants, new Americans, to our veterans. And it just feels like uh, such a violation and so painful um, given the chaos and the tragic deaths uh, of that day. Um, but at the end of the day, our democracy and our democratic institutions prevailed. After a long, long day, Congress came together and certified the results of a free and fair election. And this week, yesterday, uh, big week, we also impeached the president because we felt that he must be accountable. And that vote was a bipartisan vote to say out loud that no one is above the law. In six days, uh, the Biden-Harris administration will finally take office to build a more equitable and prosperous country. And I'm so looking forward to starting this chapter. Joe Biden has talked a lot, and Courtney, I think, mentioned it earlier, uh, about his you know, main theme of building back better. And here in New York and New Jersey and in our region, we could not be more excited. Um, and now that Democrats hold the White House, the Senate and the House, we really have a chance to help shape our country, our region and our economy for the better. First things first, uh, in light of everything that is going on and has happened, we are still going through a global pandemic. Congress has to pass the next COVID-19 relief package. Last December, as you may know, Congress passed a $900 billion relief bill to help millions of working families. And this effort uh, was necessary uh, and an important step but we know, especially in New York and New Jersey, that more must be done as the pandemic continues to help the economy. We can't move forward. We cannot move forward if we are not stopping COVID in its tracks. One critical part of any future relief measure will be robust federal aid for state and local funding. 
After all, last spring, our city and state, as you know, was at the epicenter of the pandemic. As we all know, the economic fallout from COVID has deeply affected our small businesses, restaurants, concert, performing art venues, uh, and many other countless industries who employ hundreds of thousands of people in our region. Less business means slower economic growth and a smaller tax base to support our services. Our city and state are facing massive budget shortfalls and require significant injections of financial relief to stave off the worst cuts to public services. This will be a top priority of mine and I will also work to ensure that basic needs like our kids having internet access and devices to participate in remote learning, that working families have childcare options, essential workers have hazard pay, and small businesses survive this pandemic through relief programs. In addition, Democrats, along with the incoming president-elect Biden, will also work to rebuild our nation's crumbling infrastructure. In 2017, the American Society of Civil Engineers gave our nation a D plus rating. This is just shameful. We have known for a long time that significant investments must be made to remedy everything from ports to roads to inland waterways. Last year, the House passed a $1.5 trillion infrastructure package that would help rebuild our highways, bridges, and harbors. This transformational package would help the U.S. move towards zero carbon emissions from the transportation sector and promote investments in renewable energy infrastructure. These are all critical investments to helping us combat climate change. Unfortunately, the Senate did not pass it last year, but now we are in a new era President-elect Biden himself has called for prioritizing an infrastructure plan. So there's so much work to do as we try to break through these unprecedented public health and economic crises, and there is no time to waste. But I know that together, uh, we will build back better. We will see brighter days ahead. And I really look forward to continuing our partnership together. Um, thank you for having me to share a few words with all of you. Uh, good luck on today's symposium. Thank you so much, Congresswoman Ming, and thank you, thank you for being here today under these circumstances. I know that that was a lot for you, so we really appreciate it. And I, I want to emphasize what you said about the infrastructure bill that passed in Congress and the opportunity we have now in the Senate. That's a huge opportunity for our region, and so I hope we can all we can all work on that together. So thank you so much. So now I wanna pass it on to Congressman Payne, who I believe is on with us right now. Am I, am I correct? Yes, wonderful. Welcome, thank you so much for being here, Congressman. Well, thank you, thank you for having me. And um, I'd just like to associate um, myself with the remarks of my, um, my wonderful uh, colleague, Grace Meng, who is, is a great representative um, uh, in, the, in the halls of Congress and a good friend. So it's good to see her this morning. Um, let me uh, say that, uh, you know, we are obviously in very interesting, somewhat difficult and, um, uncharted times. But uh, I think we have an opportunity to um, really have an impact uh, on this country, um, moving in the right direction um, with respect to uh, infrastructure and um, the work that the Waterfront Alliance does. So <clears throat> let me just say it's a real pleasure to be here for your 2021 Regional Symposium, Recovery, Resilience in a New Era. I wanna thank the people of the Waterfront Alliance for the invitation to speak today. Uh, they are really on the front lines in the fight against climate change. I say this because our waterfronts are the first to go when sea levels rise. They serve as a buffer between the ocean and our landscapes. That is why this symposium is so important. 
we must discuss new inventive ways to keep our waterfronts resilient. We must build and create them to withstand natural, natural catastrophes that occur as uh, global temperatures rise. If they fail, it would affect the lives and livelihoods of millions of Americans. It is something that we battle every day, <clears throat> excuse me, every day in New York and Northern Jersey. Our area contains some of the busiest harbors and most beautiful waterfronts in the world. They would be affected and possibly eliminated if we let sea levels um, continue to rise. That is why we must act now to stop global warming and save our waterfronts. For that reason, I co-sponsored and voted to pass the Climate Action Now Act. It would put our country back on the Paris Climate Agreement and it would help uh, us reduce greenhouse gas emissions uh, significantly. I also co-sponsored the Energy Innovation Carbon Dividend Act. It would impose a fee on the carbon content of fuels uh, that emit greenhouse gases. In addition, I'm a strong supporter of alternative energy. I support congressional actions to increase their use, such as tax breaks for electrical vehicles and the like. Alternative fuels are one way to reduce greenhouse, gases, greenhouse gas emissions significantly. <clears throat> In addition, they are a great way to grow our economy. There's so many opportunities for new jobs and new industries uh, that come along with that. That is something that we really uh, need to explore. Right now, the, drop, the job growth for alternative energy far exceeds that of fossil fuels. So the protection of our waterfronts is key to the protection of our land, people, and economy. That is why the work of the waterfront is so important. You are the ones who are fighting to protect and restore these valuable resources. You're educating children about the importance of the local waterfronts. You're changing the landscape of New York and Northern Jersey for the better. So thank you for letting me speak during your symposium and let me know how I can help your efforts in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Congressman. And uh, we can't agree with you more. I also was, just wanna say that our the Waterfront Alliance led Rise to Resilience Coalition is going to work with you in Congress and, and with all of our elected leaders for resilience to climate change. So thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you. I look forward to that. All right. Thank you. So I, now I want to turn it over to Mayor Bullitt, who I believe is with us today. And if, uh, so, okay, so we're going to move on. Council member, New York City Council member Costa Constantinidis. Good morning, Courtney. How are you? Great to, nice to see you. Thank you. And thank you for having me today, um, being, you know, having the opportunity to speak uh, with the Waterfront Alliance at your symposium. Um, you know, I know that 2020 was a very, very difficult year for so many of us, and I really hope that everyone is staying safe um, and healthy during this really challenging time. Uh, but, you know, as we dealt with the ravages of COVID, um, climate change did not take a break in 2020. As we saw named storms, uh, usually I'm proud of my Greek heritage, but named stores sort of reached into the Greek alphabet this year which is a very frightening prospect. Our, our waterfront was you know, under siege. And we need to make sure as a city that we're planning for a future uh, that is going to be only hotter and wetter as we go on. Uh, so this year we need to dedicate ourselves. 2021 needs to be the year of resilience in more, year, more ways than one. And the city council uh, we're going to be pushing forward a group of resiliency bills 
the Rise to Resiliency Act that I worked with the Rise to Resiliency campaign on uh, to sort of move forward in the city council for this year. And this is going to be my priority in my last year in office. Uh, the first one being intro 1620, which requires us uh, to create a, a five borough resiliency study, a plan for all five boroughs. Not, you know, we've been too focused on just Lower Manhattan. It's time for us to focus on the entirety of the five boroughs with a real plan and then being able to go to Congress and say, these are the dollars that we need as a city uh, to ensure the future of New York City. Uh, the second bill is intro 2092, which is gonna have a hearing in the city council on the 25th, which would codify design guidelines for city capital projects. Now, right now, we have a bunch of, a, you know, of different sort of guidelines uh, for capital projects, whether that's designing ventilation systems, reflective services to deal with heat, all these different like, tools in our toolbox. But the problem is, is that our, they are only guidelines. The city is not required to utilize them. And at a time where everything should be looked at through a sustainability and a resiliency lens, the, to leave out, to leave to chance, any sort of resiliency in our city capital project should not be the case. So this would codify these guidelines into realistic you know, law that the city has to follow when building in the city of New York. We can't allow for capital projects to be built non-resilient or non-sustainable. And the last bill is we're dealing with climate indicators. I've heard from so many advocates about how, this is bill um, 2149, which had a hearing uh, last month. And that would require us to look at our climate indicators. I've heard from so many advocates that they don't have all the tools in their toolbox to make sure that we know we're all talking the same language when we talk about resiliency and to integrate them into our climate initiatives in the city, which is not happening at all. Uh, so this would require climate indicators to be put into law. We have so much to do, um, but these three bills, as part of you know our year of resiliency, working with the Rise to Resilience campaign, um, this is going to be so very important. And you know we're going to continue to you know push forward. We have a lot happening in our waterfront. I'll just quickly say yesterday, very excited about the Equinor project and seeing the wind power that's gonna be plugged in to South Brooklyn. And it might've been missed because it wasn't as big of a deal for many, but to see 1200 megawatts being plugged in in Northern Astoria, we're gonna be creating with renewable Rikers Island, which I could go all day with, but you guys only give me five minutes, so I'm gonna wrap up. But when we, you know, right now Astoria has about 55% of our power generation in the city coming from our neighborhood, except we've always had to live with these stacks. Well. I want us to have, still continue that tradition of providing 55% of the city's power, but with battery storage and renewable Rikers and Equinor Wind. And we can have renewable row in Northern Astoria. That's the future I'm hoping for our, for our, our community. That's the future I'm hoping for our city, building a sustainable, resilient city of the 21st century. I wanna again thank you and the Waterfront Alliance for all of your work, all of your partnership, and this is my last year in office, my last few months uh, in office. We've passed 38 bills on climate change in the last seven years. Um, we need to, you know, I, I look forward to continuing my partnership with you into the future, even though I may not be a council member past 2021. So thank you so much for having me, everyone. Have a wonderful symposium. Thank you, Councilman, and we are behind you all the way. And uh, to all of our audience members, if you want to get involved with us on all of the initiatives and bills that that the council member just spoke about, please let us know. We are, it's a, it's an incredibly important year for us, which we'll be talking about later. So now I'd like to pass it along to Mayor Bullwidge, who I believe is with us, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, welcome. Thank you so much for being with us, Mayor. Thank you very much, Courtney. Uh, first of all, good morning. I, I want to thank the Waterfront Alliance for inviting me to participate in today's session, as well as the Waterfront Alliance President Courtney Worrell and Board Chair Chris Ward for this opportunity. And I know the speaker before me was Congressman Donald Payne uh, just before me a couple ago, and I've worked with uh, Congressman Payne for many years 
I worked with his father for many years, and he's a strong leader for the state. Uh, we thank him for his work on not only the behalf of the city of Elizabeth. At one time, he represented the city of Elizabeth, and then through redistricting, he's now in another uh, uh, another district. But I thank Congressman Donald Payne for his for his leadership, and I I would like to provide some brief comments on what we, what we might like to see in Washington. We believe that we've all seen how the recent chaos has already disrupted events to engage in any serious policy debates. So we really have to get back to policy debates after January 20th. I think it's more important, not only for the cities of this country, but for the nation as a whole. And there's much to be done here in our region to address the many infrastructure challenges and many other issues. So as the previous speaker said, we need to get started in some serious ways to address what lies ahead. And infrastructure continues to be one of those issues that demand more attention and more investment. So I'm on the US Conference of Mayors uh, Executive Board. I also serve as the chair of the Brownfields Task Force, and I've worked on the passage of infrastructure investment as a top, top priority for the conference. So the mayor's infrastructure agenda calls for more investment. Mostly, it includes investment in water and wastewater. And one of the key messages the mayors are bringing to this national debate is if we're gonna spend more money on infrastructure, we need to make sure that more of these funds are allocated to us at the local level. When we pass the money through the states or through counties, it becomes really difficult for municipalities to accomplish the goals that we're all talking about in this symposium. So we'd like to call it localizing the money. And we know that if it gets in the hands of mayors and quality people at the local level, our ability to get more localized funding to our communities means both parties, whether you're a Republican or a Democrat or or even an independent, you then have, we can come together to agree on more infrastructure. So once they make this commitment, we need to make sure they hear our message, that mayors and local authorities can do it faster, we can do it better, and we can do it cheaper. So we know this because we've already been doing this and we've been doing this for our part. In fact, we've been doing more than our part. Uh, in, our, in fact, the cities that and other local governments already provide nearly 98% of the revenue that is committed to water infrastructure. And we do this as we struggle to keep water rates affordable so many people in our communities. Just real quick, in Elizabeth, we did a public-private partnership with uh, American Water that helped service all of the infrastructure in our city. We also, many, many years ago, had what was called the Westerly Interceptor closed down by the EPA. We had to invest tens of millions of dollars in cleanup in order to make sure that we could do more economic development where the wastewater was going through uh, what was called the Westerly Interceptor in our city. In the most recent years, cities and counties have invested more than $123 billion. That's basically been raised through fees and taxes, whether it be to provide safe, reliable water or sewer services, maintain a vast physical infrastructure of pipes and pumps and plants. In comparison, the federal government for the same period contributed less than $2 billion, mostly in the forms of loans to states and cities. So all of us, who are from states and cities, all of us have our own story to tell about how water infrastructure needs and the challenges we face. So as we move forward, we must raise existing federal funding commitments substantially to support the modernization expansion. And we all know that it's not just water and wastewater treatment. This debate must also center on harbors and seawalls and flood protection, similar to what Congressman Payne was talking about. So mayors in our region and across the nation stand ready to work with President-elect Biden, the new administration, and the new Congress that we can join with him and to make more progress on these issues. It's gonna be a battle, but collectively, I believe we can do it with our influence. So I'm pleased to join you today, and Courtney and Katie, I wanna thank you for this opportunity to participate in this session. And I hope it didn't go too long. You didn't. Thank you, Mayor. I, I love the term you use, localizing the money. I, I, we, I think we can't agree with you more. And the important work that the New York and New Jersey delegation needs to do in D.C. to ensure that our region is included in these important bills that will be passed is a major priority. So thank you so much for joining us today. Thank that you. concludes our, our uh, panel of elected <laughs> officials and leaders. We thank you all for being with us today and thank you for your important work. 
So now we're going to move on to the other part of our agenda today, which is the next three speakers speaking, not in a political sense, but really about the facts and the information that we think is really important. First on the economy, next about the history of our city and our region, and then about climate change and sea level rise. With that, I'm really thrilled to introduce Beverly Hurdle, Executive Vice President and Director of Research at the New York Federal Reserve Bank. We're so pleased to have you with us today, Beverly. Uh, Beverly will be talking with us about the economic health of our region. And just remember, you can put questions for Beverly in the Q&A box on your screen. Beverly is head of the Federal Reserve Research and Statistics Group and Director of Research, where she oversees the group that provides analytic support for the New York Fed's responsibilities. We're so pleased to have you. Thank you, Beverly. You can take it away. You're on mute, Beverly. You're on mute. There okay. we go. Take two. Sorry. No I'm worries. Delighted to be with here. <laughs> be here with you today, and want to thank the Waterfront Alliance for inviting me to participate in the conference. Today, um, as Courtney has said, my remarks are going to focus on the econo economic health of the greater New York region during the pandemic. I'll talk about the depth of the downturn, the progress we've made, and our prospects going forward. And as always, what I have to say reflects my own views and not necessarily those of the New York Fed or of the Federal Reserve System. For those of you who are unfamiliar with the structure of the Federal Reserve, it is divided into 12 regional districts across the country. In recognition of the fact that the national economy is really a collection of many local economies, each with its own unique features. As shown in the next slide, figure one, the New York Fed uh, represents the second Federal Reserve District, which consists of New York State, Northern New Jersey, Fairfield County, Connecticut, Puerto Rico, and the U.S. Virgin Islands. At the New York Fed, we are deeply committed to serving our region, and this commitment manifests in several ways. Our economists conduct research on issues of importance to the region. We actively monitor the regional economy by analyzing a, a wide array of data and indicators, and we produce our own business surveys to help track regional economic conditions. We assess the financial health of households in our region and across the nation through our quarterly report on household debt and credit. We also think it is very important to hear directly from our stakeholders. We meet regularly with community and business leaders to learn about developments in our region and visit different parts of our district to talk directly with local businesses, nonprofit organizations, community groups, and importantly, the people who live and work here. This on the ground intelligence is extremely valuable and helps shape our view of the regional economy. I'm particularly pleased to be speaking to supporters of the Waterfront Alliance today. We have a common goal of fostering a resilient economy and also share concerns about the risk of climate change. At the New York Fed, we have a number of initiatives underway aimed at better understanding the risks of, that climate change poses to our financial system and the economy more broadly. The Federal Reserve has joined a number of international bodies engaged in climate-related work such as the Financial Stability Board, the Basel Committee on Banking Supervision, and more recently, the Network for Greening the Financial System. In short, we want to be part of the solution to one of the major challenges of our lifetime. Turning to the pandemic, it remains a serious public health crisis that continues to have important impacts on the global, national, and regional economies. On the regional front, we are all familiar with how hard the New York City region was hit as the pandemic took hold earlier next, last year. The next slide, figure two, shows the spread of COVID-19 in New York City, the blue line, northern New Jersey, the red line, and the nation, as compared to the nation, which is the black line. We see a tremendous spike in cases back in March and April. And even this may significantly understate the spread of the disease, given the, the lack of widespread testing back then. While the area avoided the summer surge experienced in other parts of the country, we have seen a resurgence during this winter wave. With the virus spreading widely again, there is heightened uncertainty among businesses and consumers alike. Indeed, the pandemic continues to have severe effects on the regional economy, 
and it's going to take time to get back to full strength once it subsides. Looking at business activity in the region, figure three, the next slide, shows the headline indexes from our two regional business surveys. The Empire State Manufacturing Survey, the blue line, which covers manufacturing firms in New York State, and the Business Leaders Survey, the red line, which covers service sector firms in the broader New York, Northern New Jersey region. Positive values of these indexes suggest that activity grew over the month, while negative values below the line at zero um, indicated a decline. As the pandemic took hold, businesses in the region saw an immediate and sharp drop off in economic activity as the indexes plunged to historic lows. This drop was followed by some recovery in the region's manufacturing sector. And we can see that the index turned positive. The growth has waned in recent months. Corresponding index for the region's service sector also plunged. And while it has moved up from its lows, it is yet to turn positive. Notably, the most recent findings from December were particularly weak in both sectors. Manufacturing growth was limited and service sector activity posted a significant decline pointing to renewed weakness in the regional economy. Job losses due to the pandemic have also been unprecedented. As shown in the next slide, figure four, the nation saw unemployment, saw employment decline by 15% at the outset of the pandemic, compared to 20% in New York City and 16% in Northern New Jersey. The biggest job losses by far were in the leisure and hospitality industry, followed by the retail sector and education and health. In contrast to more cyclical down, more typical cyclical downturns, job losses were much more muted in the manufacturing sector. Initial job losses bottomed out in April, and since then, a little more than half of the jobs that were lost have been gained back. Last week's job report was a disappointment, as it showed employment declined again as 2020 came to a close. The nation's employment is still 7% below pre-pandemic levels, while employment in New York City remains a staggering 12% lower. Northern New Jersey is in between with a job shortfall of 8%. Despite substantial progress, there is much less left to do, as the remaining job shortfalls in the region are two to three times larger than during the depths of the Great Recession. As often happens during recessions, some workers were much more likely to lose their job than others. Because this downturn has resulted in such large job losses in leisure and hospitality and retail, it has been particularly hard on the lower skilled workers who tend to work in these sectors. Analysis by my colleagues at the New York Fed shows that employment for low wage workers in the region dropped by nearly half at the early stages of the pandemic while high wage workers saw little, if any, decline. In fact, after growing slightly through the summer months, employment among high wage workers is now just slightly below where it was before the pandemic hit, while employment among low wage workers still remains more than 20% below pre-pandemic levels. And it's not only low wage workers who are being affected so adversely. We know that people of color have been affected by COVID-19 at significantly higher rates, and they have been hit harder in the labor market as well, with steeper job losses and more significant job shortfalls. As the pandemic took hold, consumer spending plunged alongside business activity and employment, though it has since recovered to a large extent in many places. The next slide, figure five, shows weekly consumer spending patterns based on credit and debit card information. Looking at the United States first, spending declined by 30% early in the pandemic. It then picked up, supported by the CARES Act, and essentially recovered to pre-pandemic levels, though it has flattened out um, more recently with the winter wave. In New York City, once again, the blue line, the initial drop was sharp, sharper as non-essential businesses were closed and people responded to the increased risk as the virus spread. Unlike the nation as a whole, spending net has not yet fully recovered, even as restrictions were lifted, and it remains 20% below pre-pandemic levels. Spending in Northern New Jersey followed a similar pattern, but has recovered more substantially. Despite ongoing weakness in the regional economy, housing markets have mostly held up pretty well. 
In fact, as the next slide, figure six shows, home price appreciation has picked up in many places during the pandemic. This strength has been driven by a combination of historically low mortgage rates, lean inventories, and growing demand for home office space. However, the picture is a bit different in New York City, where home prices were flattening before the pandemic began and have not picked up as much as in other places since then. Moreover, as shown in the next slide, figure seven, the city's residential uh, rental market has weakened sharply, in part because some people have taken the opportunity to work from remote locations, but also because the flow of people moving into the city has slowed. The re region's commercial real estate market has been much less buoyant than the residential market. We've seen rising vacancy rates and even some noteworthy declines for rents in office space and retail space, especially in Manhattan. While New York City's key finance, information, and business service sectors have not sustained particularly steep job losses, many of these office workers have been working from home, reducing the need for office space. And the drop-off in both tourists and uh, business visitors has weighed heavily on hotels, restaurants, bars, and retailers throughout much of Manhattan. So far, the picture I have painted is a gloomy one, and it may call into question the longer term outlook for New York City. The mass exodus of office workers and tourists, along with the loss of some residents and fewer new people moving in than normal, has wreaked havoc on the local economy. And with the city's key business sectors able to weather the pandemic by having staff work remotely, will businesses really need that much office space? Will dense cities and central business districts become a thing of the past? There are three reasons, I think, to be at least somewhat optimistic about New York City's future. First, during the depths of an economic crisis like the one we're in now, it is difficult to maintain perspective on the ability of a region to recover from even the harshest of events. For example, after 9-11, many wondered whether people would ever feel safe in a skyscraper in New York City again. My New York Fed colleagues probed this question in the months after the attack by looking at real estate market signals. While rents across lower Manhattan fell noticeably, home prices held up surprisingly well. This suggested that people ultimately had confidence in the business district's longer term prospects. And this signal turned out to be on the mark as New York City, especially lower Manhattan, enjoyed a historic boom over the new, nearly two decades that followed. Today, there are many similar signals. Rents have softened substantially, while selling prices have been more resilient, at least thus far. Second, there are many advantages to working in cities, especially big cities such as New York, and these advantages are unlikely to disappear. Economic research shows that workers in big cities are more productive and earn higher wages than similar workers in other places. In part, this is because it is easier to share ideas and learn from one another when many people are living and working close together. Though many of us have come to rely on Zoom, even if some of us occasionally have problems with the mute button, it is hard to replace the informal face-to-face -face interaction that results in greater knowledge and higher productivity that is so important in today's economy. Further, because of the volume and diversity of jobs in big cities, Workers have a better opportunity to specialize in jobs that best match their skills, enhancing the productivity advantage. While remote work may create opportunities for some people to decouple where they work and where they live in the future, big cities are still where the most specialized and highly skilled jobs are likely to be located. And third, big cities like New York offer residents a host of amenities, from Broadway theaters to neighborhood restaurants serving a wide variety of cuisines to numerous cultural attractions, all in close proximity. Once the pandemic has passed and people feel safe again, many will once again seek out locations with easy access to such amenities. All in all, the economic forces that were pushing us to live and work in big cities like New York were decades in the making and I believe they will endure once we are past the worst of the pandemic. Thus, in my view, it is far too soon to conclude that New York City's best days are behind us. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Beverly.
All right. I um, please put your questions in the box for uh, for any questions that you have for our speaker. So I'll start out with one. Um, I would like to just dig in a little bit on what you said about the importance of people working in close place, close together for the exchange of ideas and how Zoom and our ability to, to connect across great distances is a factor, but that working in person is still is still something that you see as a as a as a benefit that we that we still need. And is there research behind that? I'm wondering and, and what are, what is the Fed thinking about that in particular in terms of cities? Yeah. Um so I think you know one of the key advantages of cities, I mean th there is the ability to um you know when you're all physically in one place to to work together in ways that may be different than what you can accomplish with you know via Zoom uh, Although certainly the technology that you know supports collaboration, you know, is is improving by leaps and bounds. To me, the key thing about the cities is is the is the variety of jobs that can be available in in a relatively you know confined geographic space, and it's that matching between the the skills and interests of workers being able to really um, you know find the ideal job that you know that that maximizes their skills therefore maximizes their productivity, therefore, um, you know, allows, um, you know, greater output, um, you know, more profits for the business, higher wages for the worker. And I think it's those sort of agglomeration economies, as economists talk about, that to me are really, you know, sort of the most compelling feature of why, you know, large cities may, you know, continue to be an attractive, uh, you know, location for both businesses and workers. Okay, great. All right, and we have a question. Um, uh, so thanks for a fascinating and reassuring talk. Can you provide any insight on how the Fed is thinking of better supporting municipal finances as the pandemic rages, given the criticism and underutilization of the municipal liquidity facility, continued prospect of fiscal crises on the horizon for local governments, and potential hangover, and potential hangover effects in the broader economy that could result? Basically, how are local governments facing fa uh, faring now? Right. So, I mean, th this is obviously, you know, a, a key development of, of the pandemic that is, you know, widely tracked by many people at the same time that state and local governments are facing, you know, the need for, you know, enhanced expenses relative to the pandemic um, and all of the associated uh, economic consequences of the pandemic tax revenues are falling, you know, creating a gap, you know, those gaps at the state level cascade down to, you know, down to the local levels and municipalities. Um, um, and, you know, the, you know, that the, the research on this point is, you know, it, it is very clear that those kind the, the fiscal drag from state and local governments, you know, can be a, a significant um, drag on, on a recovery. I think that's relatively well documented as a, as a feature of the last, um, you know, recession and recovery period. Um, and so, you know, when you think about, you know, risks to the, to the forecast or the outlook, you know, for growth in the region and indeed for regions across the country, the state, uh, you know, the condition of uh, the fiscal situation in state and local governments, you know, is, is a really important consideration. Okay, and then the last question is about climate change. So can you tell us more about, about how your team and the Fed is working on climate related to the economy and the data that you work with and what you see potentially as, as the future for that work? Oh, yeah, that's a that's a great question. So I'm gonna um, I'm gonna you know, put on my hat as the as the the research director at the New York Fed, which is the area where many of the economists in you know all, really all the economists in our in our organization are. And um, I, I would say one one of the really um, you know as, as a manager of that area, we did not go to the economist in the group and say uh, please do research on climate. But when we asked the question, people had had found ways to address, um, you know, climate-related issues in their research, you know, across the full range of economists, both, you know, the economists who who study, you know, the banking industry and trying to understand, 
the risks to banks and the financial sector through their lending as, as may manifest through, um, you know, through, um, you know, sort of the event risk uh, of, of um, you know, of, of some climate change, like storms or, um, or, you know, or other, or other kinds of events that are climate related, um, you know, to under, to trying to look at um, the transition from, uh, you know, sort of carbon-based, uh, fossil fuels-based economy to some potential future based on re renewable energy and what does that transition look like? You know, you know, not just was what does the the new world look like? We're not climate scientists, at, you know, at the New York Fed, or at least in my group, we're we're economists. But thinking about what that transition looks like, how do we get there in the most efficient way? What do we think about the jobs and the people, you know, sort of left behind, you know, from the old, own from the old economy, um, as well as the opportunities that are, you know, presented with some of the early speakers, earlier speakers were talking about in, you know, in, in the new economy. So, um, you know, our role, um, I think, is to, you know, to do as much work as we can to understand those factors um, and to think about, um, you know, the, the wide variety of policies, not just the, you know, the Fed's policy tools are all um, about the monetary policy space, but other um, policies that you know, m might lie more in the fiscal or, or governmental space um, uh, and, uh, you know, understand the impact of those um, and, you know, how they might interact with the tools that we, you know, we at the Fed have. That's actually a perfect segue to our next speaker, but Beverly, I want to thank you so much for joining us and uh, it was really great and we hope to work with you more in the future. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. You're welcome. All right. So now I am, I believe that we have Lindsay Green with us. I'm so pleased, Lindsay, that you could make it. Uh, we're, we are excited to have you. Lindsay is from the New York City Economic Development uh, Corporation and is the, is the Director of Strategic Initiatives, I believe. I think I got your title wrong. I'm so sorry. <laughs> But um, we've, we've brought Lindsay here today to talk about something really important that happened yesterday. Um, and we're hoping that this will be incorporated into the work that Beverly does, and we, we are certain it will be. So, so Lindsay, take it away, and thank you for being with us. Hi, uh, thank you, uh, Courtney. Thanks for having me, everybody. And thank you, Beverly, for that uh, really uh, thorough and thoughtful uh, presentation. Um, I, um, I am the uh, Chief Strategy Officer, it was close enough uh, not to worry on the title, um, and um, I'm, I'm pleased to be here. Um, I've been at EDC since March. I actually started about two weeks before uh, COVID hit, so um, it's been you know, top of mind, um, really just tracking and, and following uh, all of the data that uh, that Beverly highlighted, and one of the biggest things we've taken away from it is obviously how disproportionately COVID has impacted um, communities of color, and that's been something that we've been we've been using to anchor all of our thoughts around um, building towards economic recovery, and uh, and obviously in, in also continuing to fight uh, the pandemic. So we're really thinking about it from a uh, a public health perspective and an economic pers and an economic perspective, and, and trying to fuse the two. Um, you know, based on that grounding, a few months ago, uh, we worked with the mayor uh, to build um, a recovery framework that's anchored around uh, four principles uh, for, for economic recovery, uh, that's trying to continue to double down on, on New York City being a stronger, healthier, and fairer city. And it's really anchored in, in, in four principles. The, the first is, is what we're all still living now, uh, which is continuing to, to, to fight COVID-19 and do everything we can. Uh, to, to, to manage this pandemic and beat it if we can. Um, you know, make the city a hub for public health research. You know, take all of the things that we know are, are critical to uh, uh, moving through a health emergency and, and, and turn those into lessons learned and investments into the future. Uh, obviously, continue to create high quality jobs uh, and do all of that again in the interest of, of, of making New York City one of the, the fairest big city in America. Um, Obviously, economic development has a really critical role to, to, to play in, in creating an equi a more equitable city, and that means investing in initiatives uh, like offshore wind and sustainable industry that, that bring jobs to New Yorkers and help them get the skills they need to, to access those jobs and keep them and excel and really build career paths. And so for all those reasons, we really feel like offshore wind is a really important 
uh, opportunity for us. Uh, as many of you know, in, in 2018, uh, uh, EDC designated uh, sustainable SBMT uh, uh, as uh, the operator for our South Brooklyn Marine Terminal. And that entity is a joint venture between the Red Hook Container Terminal and Industry City to really operate SBMT and turn it into uh, a real a hub of, of, of the future working waterfront and, and maritime activity. Uh, and so SSBMT and Equinor have been, have been partnering over the last several years to really turn that campus into the leading US offshore wind hub uh, with support from the city and EDC and, and our partners in the state. Um, Last year, the city made a $57 million commitment for capital upgrades to reactivate SBMT and, and plan for that hub. And yesterday, as, as you all know, the state announced a huge uh, commitment uh, to invest in SBMT as well and really uh, build that infrastructure to, to create that offshore wind hub. Uh, the state's target of, of, of having nine gigawatts of offshore wind energy by 2035 represents a huge opportunity for SBMT and NYC more broadly to become a regional hub for the emerging offshore wind industry. And this will really help leverage opportunities associated with carbon-free renewable energy across the board and really also advance equitable economic development. Uh, projections that we have seen uh, show us that offshore wind will generate at least 20 gigawatts of, of renewable energy across seven states in the Northeast and activate $68 billion of capital expenditure for the supply chain while doing. That's a tremendous economic opportunity that we really think we can harness uh, and, and, and create uh, truly equitable, uh, good for the community uh, activity. Just even reaching New York State's nine gigawatt goal uh, is going to allow us to power 6 million homes and create more than 10,000 jobs in the state. And that that has a huge impact from, from one project, both on the climate side and on the, the real lived experience of, of people on the ground. Uh, SBMT central location uh, where we where we have um, where we have where it is 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 really positioned well uh, relative to where the offshore wind farms are across the northeast and makes it a really convenient place to have uh, to be the hub for the supply chain and for staging and assembly of turbines and operations and maintenance as well. Uh, we anticipate activating SBMT will, will trigger a lot of the clustering of that supply chain uh, in Sunset Park and other nearby port facilities and really create um, a place where you can anchor all of the, the activities around the industry and, and, and build a hub for the future. It's our vision that this will create a lot of good industrial and, and maritime jobs that support uh, an equitable recovery across the city while also uh, helping us with our, our broader climate change goals. Um, but we're really focused on, on bringing an explicit um, attention to equity while we do that. It won't just happen because we all think it's a good idea. We're working with our partners at Equinor uh, to be really intentional in our decision making so that all of the work and the investments we're doing are really benefiting low income communities and communities of color that historically bear the brunt of, of the impacts of climate crisis. So uh, with our master lease, uh, we've worked with Equinor to, to, to invest in uh, a range of, of equitable economic uh, investments that really help us uh, achieve this outcome. The first is that we have a $5 million fund uh, that's co-governed um, by uh, Equinor and also community stakeholders from Sunset Park um, with EDC that's gonna target a and develop a talent pipeline for offshore wind related careers in Sunset Park and it's gonna support um, putting low income New Yorkers into those career tracks and, and really building uh, a green job score across the city. Uh, and then additionally, Equinor has secured a range of commitments um, from, from within their organization and partnering with us to not only minimize um, on-site carbon emissions and you know, focus on expanded targets for MWBE contractors, but they're also making a number of community investments uh, that support the growth of a hub. And that includes things like investing in capacity building and technical assistance for local businesses, uh, investing and in helping in with training and, and, and connecting residents to those training and to the jobs at SBMT and establishing um, and maintaining a community outreach center that's focused on offshore wind. All of that actually it, it are the building blocks, the foundational community-focused building blocks that are not only going to create 
an equitable green industry, but also really help us in building the offshore wind hub in in Brooklyn, in Sunset Park. And again, this is a, it's offshore wind's gonna build, play a critical role in our economic recovery. It's critical to our climate change goals. And it's, it's a real anchor pillar in New York City being an inclusive, sustainable and dynamic city for the future. Uh, so thank you for, for your time. We're really excited about um, what the opportunity brings and, and, and look forward to working with everyone who's gonna help us realize the success. Thank you so much, Lindsay. And is, is there a place where people can go for more information about the community investments and the workforce opportunities? Is, is, is there a, a location right now, maybe online, or, or is that to come? Or It's to come. We've obviously highlighted in, in the press releases that we've put together with Equinor. There's not an information hub yet because we, we're still focused on, you know, activating the terminal, but we, that will be available on, I, um, for sure, on EDC's website, also on Equinor's website, and probably eventually on a specific SBMT website that we're putting together. Wonderful. Okay. And thank you for your for the understanding. My my daughter also is excited about wind turbines and she she popped in to say hello. <laughs> That's great. No worries. Thank you so much, Lindsay. And thanks for being here. We look forward to working with you. Thanks. Take care. All right. And so I'm going to turn it over now to Chris Ward, Chairman of Waterfront Alliance. Take it away. Thank you. Thank you very much, Courtney. Thank you, Lindsay, for that um, really wonderful summary presentation. As someone who's worked on the uh, Brooklyn waterfront for most of my career, SBMT has been a vacant opportunity for over 30 years. And the fact that uh, this transformative economy is finding a home in South Brooklyn is really, a, I believe, uh, finally, finally a transformative moment for Brooklyn and its economic recovery. And just as you said, for the, the men and women who live in Sunset Park, the, the people who have been shut out of the economic recovery historically, this is really a great initiative. And I congratulate Mike Stamatis, who's a member of the Waterfront Alliance, who runs the Red Oak Container Terminal, his t the team at Equinor, who has been so persevering in, in making this thing happen. So a really amazing announcement yesterday. And, much to be proud of. I'd also like to just take a second to thank the elected officials who spoke. Um, obviously, my good friend, Congressman Payne, Grace Meng, uh, the councilman, and also Mayor Bulwich. Mayor Bulwich and I go back a long, long time in the city of Elizabeth and port development. So great to have them all here. Um, I'm so excited to introduce our next guest. Uh, he is a uh, documentary filmmaker, a uh, name I think it is incredibly well known to all of us. Um, he is a winner of Emmys, the Peabody Award. His award-winning series on New York City, a documentary sets forth a vision of our past and capturing uh, the history of the city of New York in ways that I think um, people have not understood and not seen. And I challenge Rick um, within that framework that this is a country that reinvents itself and creates uh, itself largely historically built on myths. Our ability to come to grips with issues like class, like race gets lost in a mythical past. And it's documentarians like Rick who, who bring us back to the reality of the history of the city of New York and the lives lived historically to inform us on how we might actually realistically go forward based on a common past and a common understanding of the challenges we face and overcome and allow us to break free of the myths that so confine us to a world that we're unable to respond to the challenges like climate change. So uh, as, a, as a man who has taught us so much about the city of New York, it really is my pleasure to now introduce Rick Burns. Hi, uh, thank you so much, Chris. Can you all hear me? Yes, yes, we can hear you. Thank you so much. Um, that was really lovely. I, I can't tell you all how um, grateful I am to be with the Waterfront Alliance, um, with you, Chris, um, with Courtney. Um, you know, what's gathering us here today is the thing that's gathered here, people here for literally thousands of years, which is the water. Um, and in that respect, I just wanted to, to give a shout out to one of the wonderful things, um, one of the wonderful odd things about our waterfront area, which is 
represented by nothing more powerfully than the Port Authority, which Chris ran so extraordinarily for so long. Um, you know, it's, it, the, the city is has a name, New York, but it's really the port. It's this incredible deep water port, one of the three greatest natural deep water ports in the world. It's a port, obviously, New, New Jersey um, generously shares it with New York and New York in return with New Jersey, and that's what the Port Authority really means. It's incredible. I mean, there are few, few places in the world that have five to 600 miles of waterfront in their city, within their city limits. Um, and, you know, there's a wonderful fact that, you know, water being destiny in the city's history, that, you know, as we sort of look back, not content with what nature or God gave New York um, and, and the region in terms of this deep water port, as part of their kind of restless ingenuity, New Yorkers grabbed the waterway to the, built a waterway to the hinterlands, um, the Erie Canal in the early 19th century. Um, which sort of exponentially increased that watering, rivering quality. And it meant that everything that came out of the um, center of the country from the Great Lakes region came across the, the canal down the Hudson and then past where I'm actually looking right now, down past the Hudson River, um, which made New York City by 1825 when the, that great 363 mile waterway opened really the greatest what, what, what economists and historians call transportation breaks in the world. You know, transportation break is where um, things come off of one form of transportation and put, get put onto another. And because of that, manufacturing gathers, industries of all kinds gather, um, products of all kinds grown and manufactured converge, as do the people involved with them. So this, you know, incredible, point of convergence, which has been both natural and human facilitated for so long, is a place I take enormous comfort from. And along those lines, um, you know, as I look out at the Hudson, you know, with Broadway, you know, 50 yards behind me, um, I'm made to think of the comfort we all can take in time and place, in real ways, not just kind of Pollyanna-ish ways. I mean, the half moon, if I had been sitting here in, you know, 400 plus years ago, the half moon, the Halva Maine, Hudson's, Henry Hudson's ship would have kind of sailed right past me, heading up in a project key to what was happening here from the very start, a cosmopolitan project. He was looking for China, you know, so we found China eventually, but it was part of that kind of globalization and that expansive reach was part of the Native American culture here, which brings us to the street behind me, Broadway, you know, which was a Native American highway um, for hundreds, probably thousands of years before the Dutch thought to call it Breedaway, Broadway, the only path that runs the length, entire length of Manhattan. So this has been a place, a meeting place, and a gathering place of people, literally for as long as there's been peoples, as far as I can tell. And the European kind of exponential increase of that gathering in terms of population numbers is a huge part of that story. So I thank Chris and I thank the Port Authority and I thank the Waterfront Alliance for doing this for all those reasons and many more. Um, you know, the story of New York is a story of reinvention and it's, you know, it's there in the name in some obvious, you know, kind of onomastic way, you know, somebody called York, the Duke of York, um, not just somebody as it turns out, but the future King's brother. Um, was, you know, was the person, you know, for whom this place was named and it became from, you know, York to New York. And so that idea that, that newness and, and, and reinvention is something which happens to be conveniently inscribed in the name itself, as we all, know, as we all sort of, I think, sense intuitively. Um, and so the question is, is, you know, as we think about the necessary reinventions um, to the current set of existential challenges, and by the way, there have always been existential challenges um, everywhere, and this has been one of those places um, where the power and force of those challenges has um, kind of gathered to great strength because of the density, because of the number of people. And you know, the reasons why New York has been a place of reinvention and will continue to do so, not by dint of some you know, kind of special virtue that's gathered here, but simply a, by a combination of history, historical reality, um, current reality, and necessity. 
Um, and it begins with the fact that, you know, Boston, Bo thank you, Boston. Uh, thank you, Philadelphia. Thank you, Baltimore, where I was born. You know, this is the place where America was born in the most intense way. Um, Dutch brought it, started it here as a capitalist enterprise. They had no interest in religion, chastised Peter Stuyvesant for, for being a little bit too Calvinist in his response to Jews when they first tried to come in 1654. Um, and that's uniquely single-minded devotion to um, money-making, to a capitalist enterprise, um, which was unique in the new world, um, very swiftly begat the most diverse uh, colony in the new world uh, because there are no rules for exclusion. You, know, you couldn't be kicked out of New York for anything, even if you were a Jew, as, um, as Peter Stuyvesant had found. Um, and that, I think almost genetic relationship between the commercial dedication and the diverse and the demographic diversity shaped New York, New Amsterdam, and then New York from the very beginning by making it a place of unique cultural transformation because of its openness to diversity. Um, and so it was really a place not particularly geared to the past from the very start, but geared to the future. Who are going to be the new workers? Who are going to be the new people? Who are going to be the new, what were going to be the new inventions? Um, how would you find new ways and new markets in order to um, exponentially increase the profit you could reap? Um, and, you know, out of that convergence of what we came in the 19th century to call capitalism and democracy came this remarkable culture of transformation dedicated for better and for worse to transforming. I'm sitting here in a completely transformed environment. Every end of this 12 mile long island has been transformed. It's, you know, it's not, it's natural areas like Central Park are themselves super artificial natures, um, which were created in 1950, 19, 1850s and 60s to give New York the nature it no longer had. Um, and so that history and the logic of that history has made this a place particularly keyed to, um, to reinvention. And as Lindsay and so many have spoken, you know, the concentration and the density um, that takes place as a consequence of those, the, co the concentration of those two forces, capitalism and democracy, commerce and diversity, you know, we experience it now as I'm locked down here on the fourth floor of my apartment building on the Upper West Side as problematic. But the fact is, is that that concentration and density, which has been here since the time of the Dutch and the Native Americans before them. I mean, remember, the wall was built um, in the 17th century to create a tighter and more confined as well as more protected urban environment, you know, by, 16, by 1650. Um, so that it's always been a dense place and that density allows interaction, it allows exchange, it allows buying and selling, it allows coming up with new ideas spontaneously in real time, which is exactly what cities have always done. Um, so that, that crucial reality of concentration and density related as it is to diversity. Um, you know, another reason why New York has been a place of invention has been you know, the globalization, which is sort of a, a key part of it. It has always been a cosmopolitan place. It's always been a place which is both local and global. I mean, that's why the Dutch West India Company decided to send a ship, you know, to scout out its, you know, global trading possibilities. And this became one of the most important nodes in, a, in what was the first global network of commerce and culture that ever sustained itself for a very long time. So as Ken Jackson, the historian, puts it, well, New York might be young compared to Jerusalem and Alexandria and, and even Vienna and London. Um, it is old as a modern city because of its, you know, its tenure um, as this place in which the experience, the modern experience of globalization, which is what Henry Hudson was doing, was at. You know, water, inescapably, is the reason why it's been a place of, of reinvention. You know, I mentioned it before, but I mean the importance of water in the city's history. You know, it made us first the regional um, competitive place that we were. Um, it then made us with the Erie Canal nationally dominant, and then after that, internationally dominant. So that the port of New York, meaning of course the port which the Port Authority has has guided since the second decade of the 20th century, 
um, has made this place unofficially, and it's important that it's been unofficial, but no, nevertheless completely actual, you know, the or one of the preeminent places in the world because of its um, because of its original riverine reality and its ongoing flow that it characterizes it to this day. Um, you know, if you become a point of convergence at the at a at a riverine and oceanic meeting point, um, and I think it's important for me to remember in this respect something that the architectural historian Elliot Walensky once said, um, now gone, but an incredible thinker about New York and urban places generally. Where wonderful things always happen where land and water meet. That's true, but also very complicated and often extremely problematic things happen when land and water meet in the spectacularly powerful and ultimately creative way that they've met here, um, you know, at the bottom of the Hudson, what's now called the Hudson River. Um, you know, the series of crises that have occurred as a consequence of this becoming the preeminent gathering point in North America and then later the world, you know, are astonishing and well known, but they go back to the 18th century. You know, fires during the revolution, um, fire in 1835, because there was an insufficient water supply. There it was impossible to, in fact, put out that fire. Half of, half of Manhattan burned, um, you know, at that time, um, you know, Draft riots as the result of the convergence of immigrant populations from, in that case, from Ireland. Um, you know, horrific problems in the workplace, um, the Triangle Shirtways factory fire. And you can kind of go on and on from one end of New York's history to the other, seeing these kind of breakpoints, and they've been breakpoints in the city's history, but they've become, because of the um, concentrative vortex like reality of New York. They've been breakpoints for the history of the city, the region, the country, and in many cases, the world, as 9 11 and the pandemic have shown us. Um, so, for that reason, it has had to be a place of, of reinvention because the powers of, you know, Joseph Schumpeter called it the creative destruction of capitalism. The destructive and problematic, as well as the creative and tremendously innovative. Um, powers that occur, forces that converge when you create this kind of intense meeting place of money, people, and imagination um, has required the city to be particularly, I don't even want to call it nimble, you know, with a gun to your head called an existential crisis, you're going to come up with a solution. So we come up with the Croton Waterworks um, after the fire of 1835, which has tremendous impact to this day. I'm drinking the water from that Croton Waterworks. You know, there's now, you know, um, tunnel number three underway. It's a trans-generational project in, in, in Queens to augment what began in the 1840s and 1850s with that. Um, you know, you're, you're required to come to deal with the consequences of uh, density, demographic density and diversity, both racial um, and demographic and economic. Uh, so that the first metropolitan police force in the in the country came out in the wake of the draft riots of 1863, which was this huge blow up that took place, the worst instance of civil unrest to this day in American history, when dirt poor um, Irish immigrants rebelled against the draft that was reimposed as a sideline of the Emancipation Proclamation in 1863, saying that they were now going to go south to fight and possibly die to free African Americans who had been enslaved, who would come up and compete for them for the worst jobs in New York City. So that was a problem that had to be addressed both as a policing issue and also as a, an issue that had to do with housing, health, welfare, education, um, income, jobs. Um, and so that for that reason, New York, which you could say kind of began its Euro-American life as what the wonderful historian Mike Wallace called, you know, the sort of capital of the social logic of capitalism. I mean, the place where it was really being defined. It's not for nothing that the bastard Alexander Hamilton came here of all places in the late 18th century to kind of kind of co-invent the American economic system we still live on. Um, but that because it became the center of the logic of capitalism, it also became the center of the social logic of alternatives to the bad consequences or the negative consequences of capitalism as well. Um, and so the need to um, innovate again and again and again at a metropolitan and then at a broader level, 
you know, at, at every in every conceivable way, whether it had to do with Central Park, which exists as a result of the direct result of the Irish potato famine and the influx of nearly a million Irish immigrants. You know, where the hell were people gonna do something um, other than work in this place that was so crowded by the late 1840s and early 1850s? And so the ameliorative possibilities of parks, um, the extraordinary visionary plan to have New York divided into a grid system, which exist, which was made in 1811 at a time when there were 80,000 people in New York, planning for a city of a million and a half. So that you know when you're gonna build something and people are gonna come, you're gonna have to, in fact, plan for the future into which, uh, from which those people are gonna be coming, as indeed they did. Um, you know, uh, the number, the, the, the New Deal began um, as someone, you know, as Frances Perkins said, um, the first woman uh, member of the United States cabinet and the first secretary of labor in American history, Frances Perkins was standing outside of Washington Square watching um, working girls on fire fall from the 10th uh, story of, uh, of the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory fire in 1911. And as she said, the New Deal began the day the, the, the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory burned. Um, and that sense in which something positive inevitably is going to have to come from the worst calamities and, um, and crises um, and existential challenges is, is been written into the city's history from beginning to end. Um, you know, I came here in 1975 from Ann Arbor, Michigan. That I came here two months after the Daily News headline, Ford to City Drop Dead. Um, the federal government was going to refuse and did initially refuse to bail out New York City, which is a horrifying um, economic uh, crisis at the time. And basically, it was just like, you know, solve your own problem, which was going to mean die. Um, you know, in the end, by the way, the government relented, did give New York City m money, a few billion, which meant a lot in the 1970s. Um, New York paid back every cent with interest, so the federal government actually, as it always has off of New York City, made money in the bargain. Um, and it pulled itself out of the crisis. 9-11, uh, 2008, uh, 2013 uh, with the financial crisis, uh, 2013. So in my, in my tenure in New York, you know, there have been four um, existential crises leading up to this one, which is, feels like the most existential crisis. You know, um, the idea that a, um, an event on the other side of the world could within three months become localized in New York City, which became the epicenter of the pandemic, um, locking it down entirely as we remain, that's a frightening thought. And that's a big problem. But I guarantee you that um, the number of times people wrote off New York City specifically and uh, cities in general, are so many, you could, there could be an encyclopedia of uh, anticipatory death counts um, for New York, um, going back to the 18th century. Again and again and again, it turns out to be this leader city um, is kind of leading the way and showing that, oh no, but this time we really mean it. This time for sure, there's no way out. And yet exactly because it is the gathering place, because of the exchange of ideas, and because the absolute ironclad reality of necessity is, you know, when you see and or, or see the photograph and the head of all the papers the next day, um, 144 girls um, in flames dying in the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory fire, which is just, you know, right off of Broadway. So it's not happening in some obscure, you know, it's happening in the full glare of New York and the world at once. You're gonna to have to respond to that. So, you know, we're gonna to have to respond to this one and it is not going to require a, um, a, a kind of rolling back of all the qualities that have made New York and cities everywhere um, exactly what they are. It is not gonna require um, the end of diversity. It is not going to require the end of density and the concentration of peoples. Um, because, you know what, where are we going to go to if we decide that cities aren't, you know, the future? The whole world has become a city. That's the meaning of the 21st century. And they may be sort of denser in some places than they are in others. 
but they are in escape. The world is inescapably, and it's inscribed in its this phrase, a cosmopolitan place. So what happens here for good and ill will happen everywhere. So to say that it's the end of cities is to say that it's the end of human civilization, which isn't going to happen. Climate change is the most existential crisis. Pandemic is the second most existential crisis. It feels more existential now, but it's not. The two are related. They're both related as all the crises have been to water. And all I can say is that I know in my bones that, you know, a, a wonderful colleague of mine, Margaret Loeb, has put it so simply recently in a conversation. You know, there's something about the city that has endowed it with a sense of the importance of the larger public good. For completely selfish reasons, perhaps. There's not some great saintliness about people. But when you are connected inescapably, place to globe as we are, you understand that you have a responsibility which with impact both for yourself and for everyone else to figure out how you're going to address the problems. I, you know, I don't have any idea of how we're going to address the pandemic issue, but I know that it is in the process of being addressed. Um, and I take, you know, I, the great Marxist thinker, Antonio Gramsci said, you know, think pessimistically, but act optimistically. And by pessimistically, he meant nothing more than realistically. And the thing I take finally greatest hope from is the fact that cities are intrinsically scientific enterprises. You don't need science in a hunter-gatherer society. You need a science, you need science, which is to say real knowledge in places where people have gathered and whose needs and requirements and the challenges of whose convocation has required real time, real innovation and in building, which only takes place on the basis of real knowledge, science. So, you know, science is our, in our DNA every bit as much as density is. And for those reasons, I remain in an almost un-Gramscian way, um, hopelessly optimistic about the city um, and about the world generally. Rick, thank you so much. That was really um, a compelling summary of exactly the history of the city of New York, rather than in some ways the myths of the city of New York. I'd like to ask you kind of a twofold question. Um, I started today's conference about language and politics and what is it that comes together historically where change takes place because the language matches the science or the challenge and the politic political language around it motivates the city to respond to the kind of existential challenges where has leadership been in those moments and then to ask you a little bit about a little crystal balling here with that understanding of what a new political framework would be to deal with the two pressing existential crisis, where does this transformation now take us to the next transformation of the city of New York? And I always like to end with the great line by Henry James that New York City skyline is swept clean every 25 years and James meant it as a criticism because we change so rapidly and here what you've described is exactly our genius that we do change rapidly where do you think that next change might be? And where's the political language to capture that change and make it real? You know, uh, Chris, to your first, to your first question and, and thought, um, you know, if I understand it correctly, you know, I think it's every major break point in American history, you know, I'm sorry, because this may seem tendentious to put it this way, but, you know, we began, uh, um, in a colonial circumstance which was beset by a horrific labor shortage in the beginning, as all colonial situations are, which is to say we began with slavery. Um, that conferred upon enslaved peoples uh, a, a, an, an, an uncomfortable reality. Um, and it also conferred on the unenslaved people an extremely um, 
wonderful perquisite, which is that by, by dint of not being enslavable, by dint of not being a, a people of color, you got something. That's what you know, W.E.B. Du Bois called the wages of whiteness. And so the wages of whiteness have been inscribed in American history and the history of New York, therefore, from the start. And every time those wages go through a transformational challenge, we have had a moment like the one we've been living through. You know, it, it occurred in the 1820s and 30s with the nullification crisis. It occurred during the Civil War, lead up to the Civil War. Um, it occurred in the, 18, in the 1920s and the 1960s, and it's occurring again now. And what happens is that the language of the culture um, and, and the agreed upon semiotics of reality get fractured during those moments. So that you could not convince when Preston Brooks from South Carolina nearly beat Charles Sumner to death on the floor of the Senate, you know, in the run up to the 18th, to the Civil War. You could not convince a person from South Carolina that he was not doing the right thing. That he had an existential duty to do that. And they, even as he was decried across the North, Preston Brooks, his supporters sent him canes. So, you know, that moment of polarization reflected in that moment of which there's no shared language and there's no shared reality, which has happened, as I say, three or four or five times and we're living through one of them now. You know, there's, I don't take comfort in the fact that it's happened before, but I take comfort in the fact that it's legible. So now, once again, surprise, surprise, surprise following the first African-American president in American history, the sense that the perquisites of whiteness are under a particular kind of threat by some people, I mean, in the view of some people, has reached, enough, has reached a high in which it's pulled apart the ability, you know, I'm often accused of living in a bubble here, you know, in the glories of, you know, the Upper West Side of Manhattan. I don't live in a bubble. I live in a place with unique access and required um, understanding of the larger world. So don't, call, don't say I'm living in a bubble. I just don't, I just am not one of those people who believes we should be sending canes to Preston Brooks, which was a bad thing at that time, and it would be a bad thing now. So that there are some truths, even when people don't come to believe me. So I think what's going to happen is, you know, the extremism, you know, Juliet Kayam from The Atlantic, who we all see on CNN, said something really fantastic about it re really recently and wrote an article in The Atlantic, which I commend. You know, we need a tactical response to extremism right now, which basically is going to mean to say that the leader of the extremism is a loser in every con considerable way, because every historical counterpart has shown, every precedent has shown that when the spokesperson, the chief spokesperson for the extremism um, loses traction and is um, drummed out of business, slowly the ability to cleave to the unreal, unscientific non-truth loses its hold. It's not like a light switch going off. Um, in, terms, in terms of change, you know, I think attention to climate change, um, attention to the realities of um, that have to change. You know, Mayor Bloomberg, when he was mayor, could not, you know, get the uh, pricing um, zoning legislation through. But then it came through in a certain way later. We're going to discover that as we go forward, things which seemed politically unreachable are going to feel more reachable because of the crisis. Um, you know, will the tables go in from the restaurants along our, our avenues and streets? Um, will this become a city even less than it already was, um, dominated by the automobile? Dominated as it is, but less than any of every other American city. So I think that um, the moment of, moment of crisis is, in the cliche, a moment of possibility. And I think that what we're gonna see is um, a city in which the longer 
view and the importance of grab, um, as Margaret said, you know, the importance of understanding the larger greater good is going to take hold and by no means uniquely in places like New York, but in urban centers everywhere and spread out from there, um, in which um, I think we'll probably look back on this hideous pair of years, 19, 2020 and 2021, and look back at them as a kind of a, a much bigger break point than, for example, 2001 was. 2001 was a kind of a break point in so far as like the planes gouging holes in, in the skyscrapers, it revealed something. I think this is going to be a break point, which is not just about revelation, but about the, a call, an inescapable call to required action and change. Thank you, Rick. That was really, really a wonderful, wonderful presentation. Brought us all together with a, a sense of optimism at the end there, which we we really appreciate um, as we're all challenged with our future and how we might, in a sense, rebuild our city out of this crisis. I'm sure everybody would love to unpack all of what you said and ask a ton of questions. Um, we will continue to facilitate your conversation, but right now um, I would really have to, I have to move on. It really brings me great pleasure to thank you again, Rick. Um, and now to turn to my other colleague, on the Waterfront Alliance, um, Hillary Lane. Uh, Hillary has joined the Waterfront Alliance recently and brings a background um, to the science, to the, to the environmental questions facing the city. So please take it away, Hillary. Thank you, Chris. Um, I am honored and I am proud to be a partner and a board member of the Waterfront Alliance. And I'm sure most of you know the Waterfront Alliance is the premier advocacy organization that is working in our region to enact meaningful coastal policies and to spearhead the investments that they require. Um, it's very gratifying to see so many people in the chat room having conversations, posting information, because that is the impetus that drives the action and the achievement. Um, that we're working so hard for. So I just want to talk very, very briefly about the Rise to Resilience campaign, which the Waterfront Alliance is spearheaded and which I know so many of you are involved in, uh, nearly two years in the making. Um, it brings to the table a lot of voices and um, is working toward consensus on a policy platform that will um, ask for a comprehensive set of policy and investment that will ensure resilience in our region protect ourselves, our economy, property, now and in the future. And now I'm very happy to introduce Dr. Maureen Ramo, um, who is one of the preeminent earth scientists. Um, she is a self-described puzzler, and she's been working to put together the pieces of the gigantic puzzle that we call Earth. She has studied planetary heating and cooling, the absorption from um, the atmosphere of carbon dioxide and the release of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere and sea level rise, past, present, and future. She is the director of the core repository of the Lamont Doherty Earth Observatory at Columbia University, where she also earned her PhD, and she is now the interim director of the observatory itself. So um, I'm very pleased to welcome you, and we look forward to hearing all about the science that is driving this conversation that we're having today. Uh, well, thank you so much, Hillary, and, and thank you, Courtney, and, and the rest of the Waterfront Alliance for inviting me to be here. I'm very pleased to be here. And Rick, you could not have given a better segue for me to talk about the science behind coastal resiliency. Um, so, you know, they say that, that scientists are slaves to their PowerPoints and um, Oh, host disabled screen sharing. I need you to be able to let me share my screen. Can you enable that? Can the host let me share my screen? Yes, or you should be all set now. Okay. So all panelists. Uh, okay, thank you. So, um, great. Can you? 
I'm going to assume everybody can see that. Yay. Thumbs up yeah. somewhere. Yes. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> thanks. So um, as Hillary said, I, I work at Lamont Doherty Earth Observatory. It's where all the uh, earth and climate science research of Columbia University is centered. And this is just an aerial photo of our campus um, that is located in southern Rockland County. Now, um, I want to start, uh, I, I think I was going to say, if, you know, we're slaves to our PowerPoint and, and I will sh be showing you some data, but I hope you find it useful and great kind of like back pocket information that just informs everything we think about uh, what this century is going to hold for us. Um, and of course, what I am a geologist and we think about these problems on geologic timescales. Here's the last 10,000 years. Um, oops, sorry, you could think about this as a as a stock chart, so to speak, and as we go forward uh, 10,000 years, um, we get to the Industrial Revolution uh, in the mid-1800s, and at that point, the atmospheric CO2 concentration in the atmosphere starts going up dramatically. And that is, of course, because of the combustion of fossil fuels and the byproduct CO2, which is invisible uh, and doesn't smell, but is in the atmosphere and causing us problems. And so today it's 414. Um, so um, how important is CO2 in controlling Earth's temperature? I know I am uh, speaking to the choir here, uh, but be, we have the Earth's sun distance, we have the amount of radiation put out by the sun, the solar constant, and we have our greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. Greenhouse gases in the atmosphere is the thing we can change and we are changing it. But you don't have to believe me, right? You can believe um, data. And I'm trying to start this. Oh, darn. Oh, here we go. You don't have to believe me. We humans have been measuring uh, temperature on the Earth's surface for uh, as long as we've had the, t the technology with thermometers. And uh, these are data from NASA compiled from around the world, uh, global surface temperature records. And again, you can very clearly, clearly measure in so many ways that the Earth's surface temperature is warming. And um, the mean global temperature is risen by almost one degree Celsius. The other thing you can see here super clearly is that um, that warming is very amplified in the polar regions. And there's a lot of reasons for that. But the most intuitive might that, that you can understand is just that as it gets warmer, there's less snow and ice. And snow and ice tend to reflect sunlight very effectively. So when you have less of it, you're also then absorbing more sunlight at high latitudes. So it's this really insidious positive feedback. So, um, how sensitive are the ice sheets to uh, this modest global warming that we've observed? There's so many ways to look at this. We can look to times in the past. We can model it. Um, I tend to look in the past, and uh, we study the history of polar ice sheets. And I just want to point out that there's three major polar ice sheets. There's the Greenland ice sheet, the West Antarctic ice sheet, and the East Antarctic ice sheet. Greenland and the West Antarctic ice sheet, if you melted them completely and spread all that water evenly around the planet, sea level would rise by about six meters, which is about 20 feet or so. The East Antarctic ice sheet is far greater and that has about 55 meters of sea level approaching uh, 175 feet of sea level rise. So. Uh, what's happened so far is that sea level is rising. Uh, I know that's not news to you. Uh, most, so about a third of that sea level rise is due to thermal expansion. Just the mere heating from global warming of the water is causing it to expand. As we know, heat causes substances to expand. And then an increasing amount of the contribution to sea level rise is coming from glaciers and ice caps, Greenland and Antarctica. And these are the sources of sea level rise that are increasing. Nowhere is the planet warming faster than in the polar regions and uh, both in the Northern hemisphere. And also you can see here, this is satellite data of Antarctica and it's measuring mass loss of ice from satellites. And um, you can see that it's pretty significant 
over the last, uh, this is from 2003 to 2013, that mass loss is continuing to the present and is pretty significant in the West Antarctic ice sheet over here. You can see in blue that there still are places that are gaining mass, but the net is a loss of mass in both Greenland and Antarctica. So we have also been measuring the height of the ocean around the world for over 100 years. And this is a record of sea level rise globally based on thousands and thousands of tide gauges around the world. We have one in the battery at Lower Manhattan that would be in this data set as well. And you can see uh, the red and the blue are both tide gauge studies and the little bit of black up here at the top um, right is satellite data of sea level rise. And you can see this very clearly a long-term trend in sea level rise that um, globally has uh, adds up to about eight inches over this time interval. And you can see also probably see two things. One, uh, not only is sea level rising, but the rate of sea level rise is accelerating and it's now three millimeters per year up from one and a half millimeters per year averaged over this whole interval. So what do I know for sure? What happens at the poles doesn't stay at the poles and the ice sheets are melting and that water is showing up on our shorelines all around the world. And that sea level rise is not a problem for the future, it's a problem for the here and now. Um, communities around the world are already struggling with the slightly less than a foot uh, average rise that we've seen. Although I'll come to um, talk in a second about how regional trends and sea level rise. So every coastline will have unique challenges that are unique to it, its geology, its environment, and, and where it is in the world, its geography. And uh, this is just a few different examples on the upper left. I'm sure some of you, uh, if not all of you, will recognize uh, northern New Jersey uh, after Hurricane Sandy. Hurricane Sandy was dramatically more devastating because you basically added a foot of sea level rise over the over the last hundred years that and every little increment of sea level rise dramatically amplifies the power of storm surges and the volume of storm, sur storm surges. In the upper right is a picture of Male, the, the capital of the Maldives. And again, just a perfect example of at what you can imagine are, are the existential threats faced by island nations throughout the Western Pacific and Indian Ocean. Islands that are built on uh, coral reef atolls that are typically only a few feet at most average elevation above sea level. Lower right is Venice, obviously, at um, St. Mark's Plaza. Venice has a terrible problem because the land is sinking, obviously, I'm sure. And so, you know, they have been struggling for centuries to keep the water out. And the mere fact that they cannot in this day and age is testament to how difficult this problem is. Sorry. Um, whoops. And then the lower right, lower left is Miami, which is on porous bedrock. And so uh, they can't build a wall. They need to literally pump the water out as fast as it's coming in up through the bedrock, which is, you know, a Sisyphean task, as you might imagine. So the frequency of nuisance flooding, the return times of what used to be called 100 year events, all have been amplified by the current and ongoing rise in sea level. This, I love this little figure on the left, on the, um, on the right bottom is the states, all the different tide gauges in different states, and then it's going from 1950 to 2015 through time on the left. And what's this, the height and color of the bars reflects the number of days of years of nuisance flooding. So uh, again, every increment of sea level rise increases the return time of a hundred year event, making storms more devastating, and then just the ongoing nuisance flooding, which in my village, we were already dealing with on the Hudson River in Piermont, and I'm sure many of you are too. So um, I'll just uh, talk about a, a, a thought I would like to leave you with, which is one of the key scientific insights of maybe the last 10 to 15 years. 
And uh, I'll, I'll show you what I mean in a second. And, and that is, is that our ocean is not a bathtub. Uh, the water is not gonna go up and down uh, in concert around the world. Uh, what we know is the land is always moving. And I know some of you probably heard about ice sheet loading and depressing the earth um, in maybe your geology class in high school or in college, New York City would be very, um, New York City would be located right here on the four bulge. So the land under New York City is subsiding as it still recovers from the ice age 20,000 years ago. And so that is causing sea level rise to be a little larger here. Um, however, here's something that's really gonna blow your mind, I think. That, that loading and unloading of the land from the ice sheet um, happens over thousands of years. But if an ice sheet just starts melting um, and that water goes into the ocean, the ice sheet itself exerts less a gravitational pull on the ocean. Okay, so right now Greenland is pulling the ocean towards it. And as it melts, sea level will actually fall around Greenland and same thing for Antarctica. And so what does that really mean? These arrows point to New York. And what this figure shows is that if you had one meter of sea level rise, how high would the sea level rise where you are located? And you can see right here, if there was one meter of sea level rise from melting of Greenland, sea level would only rise by about 40 centimeters in New York. Um, if that sea level rise came from melting of Antarctica, sea level rise would rise by 1.25, one and a quarter meters in New York. So what this is telling you is that not only does it matter that the poles are melting, it matters which ice sheets are melting. And for instance, if you lived in Northern Scotland, you're not really worried about Greenland melting because it's gonna cause a sea level fall where you, where you live. So it's actually all pretty complex and scientists, and I can speak on behalf of the scientists at Lamont and elsewhere, you know, we're working really hard to unravel these effects, which are happening in real time while monitoring the ice sheets and trying to predict what those patterns are going to be. Because these are the kind of data that you need to best guide resiliency planning. So that'll just bring me to the end. How bad will it get? Here's the tide gauge and the satellite data I showed you for the 20th century. Uh, it might be a foot by the end of the century. It could be four feet or six feet by the end of the century. It depends on these blue bubbles, RCP 2.6 versus RCP 8.5. And you're thinking, okay, what's the blue bubble? That is basically us. It depends on us and what we choose to do. RCP stands for representative concentration pathway. What are human historical CO2 emissions going to do over this century? And that is what's going to determine the rate of warming and the rate of ice sheet melting and therefore the rate of sea level rise. Currently, we are on this red business as usual path. This black bar right here are the um, nationally defined um, commitments of the Paris Accords, the emission pledges, the pathway we're pledging to try to stay on. Um, of course, many scientists think that, uh, you know, to get to that only one foot of sea level rise, you need to be even much more aggressive about approaching a future uh, with fewer emissions and actively uh, decarbonizing the atmosphere. So again, is there a lot we don't know about ice sheets and their physics and their responses to uh, warming climate and the oceans around them? Absolutely. But the single biggest variable in what will control the path of sea level rise in this decade, uh, sorry, in this century will be the choices we as humans make. So this really is an all hands on deck problem. Um, I'll just end by giving a pitch for both Lamont and Columbia University. We are busy uh, creating a huge transdisciplinary sea level initiative that is crosses many disciplines um, 
and departments and schools at Columbia University. Um, again, how is the science can be best used to guide uh, informed just solutions to global uh, response to climate change and surprise in particular. Um, I'll just give a plug for uh, the second managed retreat conference that will be this June sponsored by the Earth Institute at Columbia University. Um, and I would encourage you to go online and register for that if you're interested. And then um, finally, I'll just thank you for listening. And I will thank everybody uh, in the Waterfront Alliance and on this conference for basically committing and helping to create a better world. So thank you for your time and um, I'm happy to answer questions. Thank you. Maureen, thank you. Um, there are definitely some, uh, some specific questions in the Q&A box, um, which hopefully you'll be able to answer. And I just like to throw out one um, about our region which is um, whether you can help us visualize what our barrier islands would look like um, and the Atlantic coast of Staten Island in New York City. Yeah, well, I mean, what, one of the, what, I mean, one of the things we do is we study uh, the last interglacial period when climate was a little bit warmer because we were a little bit closer to the sun at that time because of long-term changes in Earth's orbit. And, um, and the barrier islands were underwater. I mean, all of Miami, all of Southern Florida was underwater. And in fact, you know, if you drive along some of the coastal roads in uh, Coral Beach and, and Miami Beach and look at the rock, it's all submarine sediment. So, you know, I, I, I don't think the answer is, is that the islands are gonna magically build up as the sea level rise. There, some of that could happen through on, on slope um, transfer of sediment, but, you know, I think this, this conference managed retreat speaks to that. I mean, that's what we need to know. The areas that are gonna to have to be abandoned. But again, a lot depends on what we do as a global society in the next 10 years. I mean, it's critical. It's like we're running out of time to like, kind of like turn the ship of state away from the iceberg, so to speak. Well, you know, you have the word of everybody here. We're, <laughs> we are on it. I know. <laughs> Thank you so much. And um, again, you have a couple of questions in that, in that Q&A box um, that are specific. Do you want me? Um, so we are going to jump past the schedule break that we had because we're running a little bit behind schedule. And um, just before we move into our next panel, I just want to tease at the end, um, we will have the highlights of the Waterfront Alliance's mayoral platform, what we expect from the candidates um, with regard to climate change and to coastal resilience in our region. Uh, for 2021 and into the future. Um, and now I'd like to introduce Jarrett Murphy, um, who has worked with the news organization City Limits since 2007, as well as with WFUV-FM, Hartford Advocate, Village Voice, and CBSNews.com. Um, he's a wonderful person to have with us to moderate this next panel discussion, which is going to look at prospects for recovery across our region, um, including a variety of industry experts um, who Jared, you can introduce. Thank you so much, Hillary. Thank you, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here and honored to be part of this symposium and uh, an honor to be leading this very interesting conversation. Sorry that we have uh, gone past your break, but hopefully everyone has taken a chance to refresh. Uh, and what we're talking about really is uh, one of the signal changes in the city over the past 20 to 30 years, which is, you know, there's been this renewed embrace of the waterfront, um, changing it from an afterthought or an edge or a boundary of the city to part of our, an integral part of our economy, our identity, our culture. Um, and the conversation we're going to have now reflects that. Um, we're going to talk not just about the waterfront, but about the broader economy, including businesses that are active along the coastline, but others too. Um, how it is faring, what the outlook is for the near future, uh, for the more distant future, and um, what we're looking for from leaders in City Hall, in Albany, and in Washington um, to help those sectors uh, not just navigate the current public health and economic crisis, but other challenges like inequality and climate change that we also know the city faces. And so I'm really pleased to be, glad, glad to be joined by um, a six-person panel of experts and luminaries in a number of different fields. They are uh, Julia Bovi, who is the Director of External Affairs at Equinor Wind US. Jose Ortiz Jr. is the CEO of the New York City Employment and Training Coalition. 
John Nardi joins us. He's the president of the New York Shipping Association. Carlos Sushora, Sushora is the president and CEO of the New York Building Congress. Timothy Sullivan is the CEO of the New Jersey Economic Development Authority. And Catherine Weil, the president and CEO of the Partnership for New York City. Thank you so much to everyone for joining us for this panel. If you are listening, you have a question, um, as I think has been the case throughout this symposium today, uh, please uh, throw it into the chat. We'll be monitoring that and trying to squeeze those in as we can uh, in the 40 to 50 minutes or so we have to have this conversation. But I want to start with Julia, um, perhaps because it'll allow us to start an optimistic note, given the announcements yesterday by the governor uh, regarding the South Brooklyn Marine Terminal and uh, the future of wind there. But talk to us about your sector. What has the impact of the pandemic and the restrictions on uh, social interaction and commerce? What effect has that had for you? Thank you so much for having me. And thanks for letting me kick it off because it is a, a pretty huge day uh, for our sector and, and for Equinor and Brooklyn in particular. Thanks. Um, you know, we have been quite lucky in a lot of ways compared to other industries during the COVID shutdown. We certainly were delayed in the surveys that we're doing of our offshore wind lease areas. So as we saw with the cruise industry, um, being on a boat with a lot of people is, is not COVID safe um, without a lot of quarantining and testing beforehand. And so that certainly was tough and we did miss some time usually try to get these surveys started the minute the weather turns in, you know, in April, and we had to wait until the summer. But, uh, you know, we have all been able to work really hard at our computers. Um, in some ways, I think our bid that we submitted to New York in October for uh, the two projects that won yesterday might have even been stronger because we were all sitting at our, <laughs> at our desk 24-7 working with no, nowhere to go. Um, but I think a, a number of factors have come together in this very exciting moment for, for offshore wind. And that includes sort of the, it's, it's very much the spirit of the climate legislation in New York, but I think we, we see it elsewhere. We're going to be spending this enormous amount of money on offshore wind, private companies like Equinor, our financers. Let's spend it in the communities that have previously borne uh, the worst consequences of our old energy system. So we're talking about climate vulnerable communities, uh, environmental justice communities. Let's make sure that the jobs working to build offshore wind come from these communities. Let's make sure that these family supporting jobs are located there. So that's certainly the hope uh, for South Brooklyn Marine Terminal and for the Port of Albany. Obviously can't happen fast enough, um, but that's really Equinor's commitment and, you know, the folks at the New York City uh, um, EDC have been really terrific in, in making sure that Equinor has made the right kind of commitments uh, in order to be able to use that space. Carlo, uh, talk about your sector. Obviously, construction and building, some of those uh, efforts were included in the essential work that was allowed to go forward, uh, and other projects, obviously not. What's been the sort of sum total of effect on the people you represent uh, of this crisis? Well, thank you, Jared, and, and it's great to be here with everyone. Um, look, I think, you know, people were worried back in March and April and May as to what was essential, what was going to open in June. Um, I think the governor and the mayor did a, a good job in keeping uh, some projects open that couldn't just shut down. You know, I, I, I told the story many times that, you know, you shut an office down, close the lights, shut off the computers, that's easy. But when you've got 500 men and women on a construction site, scaffolding, cranes, it's not as easy to just shut the door and walk away. So um, we worked very hard to include many of those projects uh, moving forward. I think the real question is what's next? So we got through 2020. Uh, people are busy right now on projects that have already started or that are in the pipeline. The question becomes, are we planning? Are we in design stage and engineering? Are we getting projects ready to go in 2022 and 23 and 24? Um, is the city of New York allowing SCA and DDC and DOT and DEP to continue moving forward with design and planning. If you don't design a plan, there's nothing to break ground on next year. So that's something we're really focused on right now. 
The other thing we're focused on is what's next for infrastructure. The governor about an hour ago laid out a very bold uh, agenda, uh, really focused on a lot of renewable energy, which he talked about yesterday, um, affordable housing on the west side of Manhattan, really focusing on not just uh, Moynihan and Penn Station and rebuilding them to look beautiful, but also adding major train capacity, which is critical, uh, fully getting the MTA's capital budget done. So I think the, the Port Authority bus terminal, the airports, there's so much on infrastructure. Uh, we got to get it paid. Uh, I think we'll hear from President-elect Biden in about four or five hours. Uh, I've been told he's going to lay out his priorities for his phase two stimulus program on infrastructure, which is going to be very closely tied to phase one in the coming months. So assuming there's money from the federal government, assuming the MTA, the Port Authority, the city, the state gets funding, interest rates have never been lower, never been lower. Think about that. Now's the time to invest. Green technology, uh, renewable energies, mass transit, and really getting these projects done so that we have work for the next 10 to 15 years, and that's exciting. John Nardi from the New York Shipping Association, something we've heard about a lot during this pandemic is the supply chain. A lot of talk with the supply chain, obviously more recently for vaccines, but about PPEs, about uh, other commerce. Can you talk about how ports uh, have fared during this crisis and what kind of challenges and contributions they've been part of? Yeah, sure. Thank you, Jared. And thank you to Courtney and the Waterfront Alliance for this opportunity. So, so the New York Shipping Association, just a second, you know, we are the uh, entity who negotiates the longshore contract in the port of New York and New Jersey on behalf of the ocean carriers and the terminal operators. So, uh, but we get involved in any issue that affects the flow of freight through the port because we have to pay for that contract with, um, you know, with the, the freight that comes through the port. I'll just give you a, you know, um, I have a, this may be a New York centric panel, but from a port wide perspective, I'll give you uh, what's going on um, or what's been going on the last five months. Just take a few minutes. So back in March, you know, things were a little bit different than they are now. And, uh, you know, everybody at that end of March was told, hey, go home, shelter in place, quarantine, stop the spread, social distance. But you, the longshore workers and the port workers, you go to work together and get the freight. And people were pretty, uh, pretty anxious back then, you know, because the the the, uh, the virus is uh, painted as a death death sentence back then, and people didn't know what they know uh, what they know now. Uh, so we, for the first you know month or so, April, we spent a lot of time developing uh, safeguarding guidelines for the longshore workforce and the port employers. Um, we set up uh, temperature checks for 3,500 people on a daily basis, and I don't know if you ever tried to do that, but I can assure you if you go to the yellow pages, you're not going to find a company that, that does that for you. So um, uh, we had to instill confidence in the workers that, yeah, you're going to come to work and you're not going to get sick and you're not going to uh, you know, get worse than that. Uh, also, longshore workers don't get paid if they don't show up. So if um, they get sick from the virus, then they, would have, then they, wouldn't, uh, they wouldn't have an income. So uh, we created a fund for them that if they did get the virus, and we've had over uh, 250 people of them who have come down with the virus since then, they get, uh, they get income. So they don't have to worry about coming to work and losing their income. Um, so we forget about all those unknowns back then, uh, but we set up these safeguards. We work really closely with the International Longshoremen's Association. The cooperation between, with them and the Port Authority and uh, Metropolitan Marine Contractors which is another so labor association. We worked really hard together to get the PPE in place, which was really hard to find back then. Um, the masks, the sanitizers, we, we got it direct, you know, we ordered it direct from China and we kept the supply chain open, you know, for the PPE, for the goods that were coming in, for, you know, for the people who were home quarantining. And, you know, fortunately, it was fortunate for these workers that they didn't lose their jobs like many others did, which was really unfortunate. But they were also worried that, you know, coming to work, they were going to get sick and, and uh, they, would, they would suffer with that. So um, April, May, June, volume was really difficult. It was tough. You know, ships were, uh, were not coming. Uh, China was closed down. Then Europe was closed down. And, you know, we're an international business. 
and volumes were down 15, 18, 20% in April, May, June, August. And all of a sudden, somebody flipped a switch. And now from September through now, the supply chain has the volume through the port has been growing uh, 15, 20% year over year compared to previous years, uh, compared to last year. And we're at the point now where the supply chain is really fully, fully extended and um, fully occupied. And I'd like to thank everybody on this call for that because I'm sure all of you have had a package or two or maybe a couple of hundred show from Amazon that uh, started somewhere in China that uh, is now, you know, coming through the, uh, through the supply chain. Uh, New York is very fluid right now. Um, you know, we have our challenges. Uh, there's shortages on truckers. There's shortages on warehouse workers. Um, the freight is taking a long time to get to where it needs to be, but it is moving. Uh, just for comparison's sake, on the West Coast, there's currently 36 ships at anchor because there's no way to put the freight in LA Long Beach right now. So that's, um, you know, I think it's a, a, great, uh, a great thing that we've been able to keep the supply chain open. Um, but again, some of the challenges that we're facing today and going forward is really how do we get workers into the supply chain? Um, I know it's been, you know, people talk about, you know, people who've lost their jobs uh, over the, throughout the pandemic and it's, you know, really been tragic for a lot of people, but we can't get enough people to drive trucks, we can't get enough people to work in warehouses. Um, you know, unemployment, some of the unemployment compensation levels that were being paid through a period of time, people were making more money to stay home unemployed than to work. So I think we're through that. But, uh, you know, we've been working very closely with the, uh, with the local colleges in the port area to try and educate them and develop curriculum that, uh, you know, people, you see the port and you don't even know it's there and you don't realize the opportunities that are there. But we're working with the educators to educate people in the local communities and some of the people who've been left behind in the past to get them into the supply chain to help us move this industry forward because it grows and it continues to grow. You know, people- John, that's an excellent excellent point. I wanna leave that for a second because I wanna come, yeah. come back to that uh, in a bit. But I, I also wanna bring in uh, our other guests, Jose, Catherine, and Tim to talk right. about, you know, it seems, it seems like uh, Carlo, kind of uh, hit the nail on the head when he said, we got through 2020, which is probably the only way to refer to that year. Uh, and now we're in 2021. And I'm curious your picture for the, the prospects for the people you represent and the sectors that you cover now, based on the current state of play, obviously there are big unknowns about what's coming from Washington, but Catherine, starting from you, what, what is your outlook for 2021 uh, and the, the business sector in New York City? I'm meeting. So uh, I think I think the outlook for 2021 is going to be tough in terms in both an economic and a fiscal sense. While it's good news that we expect more support from the federal government, we still have a deep hole to fill. And in terms of our economy, while we have uh, kept the economy going at uh, at one end of the economy by working remotely in our financial services, professional services, media industry, technology sectors. Uh, they have managed almost seamlessly to uh, keep business going. At the same time, there's been a very dramatic hit on certain sectors, and including many of those that employ low-wage workers. So we've had a, 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 a specific problem there, and I don't think that's going to improve quickly. Hopefully, distribution of the vaccine will mean that by summer, we see uh, office workers coming back, and we see a restart in uh, in the neighborhood economies of the city, particularly in Manhattan, where they've, they've hollowed out more than others. But it's, it's not going to be quick, and small business will continue to suffer. We were doing a small business resource network with the five borough chambers of commerce and the New York City EDC, and we're finding that businesses with fewer than 10 employees, uh, many Black, Hispanic, immigrant-owned businesses, are absolutely desperate. They do not have revenues coming in. They're not able to rehire. They probably uh, lost almost a million jobs uh, that were lost to small business during, uh, during the COVID. And those are not coming back at the pace that's necessary 
for people who don't off, often don't have many options. So brick and mortar, small business, retail, obviously we know about tourism and that's gonna take even longer to come back, the Broadway stages, et cetera. So those who could work remotely have done fine and kept the economy going. They've reduced their travel expenses. So they've got uh, decent bottom lines, but the local economies of our neighborhoods are and are going to continue to be in tough state, shape. The, the projections are we won't be back to 2019 levels of economic activity until probably 2024, 2025. Tim, what's the outlook like in New Jersey? Any different from that, especially when it comes to things like, you know, some of these questions about what kind of uh, secular changes we're seeing. Are, are people going to uh, keep ref refrain from coming back to urban areas? Uh, are people going to continue working from home? Those questions about how much the economy has permanently changed. How do those influence your outlook for 2021? Yeah, it's great to be with everyone. And first off, I feel like this is sort of like a reunion of uh, old friends and colleagues from my days in the Bloomberg administration between Kathy and Carlo and others. We should be talking about, you know, Mayor Bloomberg's five borough economic strategy and borough president Markowitz and all the good old, uh, all the good old days. Uh, but it's great to be with you um, all. Um, look, I, I think I, my take is pretty similar to Kathy's. Um, I feel better today than I did six months ago, for damn sure, about 2021 and 2022. But I think it's going to be a bit of a tough slog. I think... Um, Anyway, I think we're going to pull out of the immediate crisis, you know, with vaccines and whatnot. That'll happen faster than I would have thought. I would have thought 21 was going to be a total wipeout. It looks like by the, you know, however the pro progression of vaccination goes, we'll be back to something approaching normal lifestyle-wise sometime this year, which is great. But I think the, there's deep scars, as Kathy was just describing, in, in significant sectors. And in New Jersey, you know, we're the densest state in the union. So a, a pandemic that thrives principally on density is going to hit us, you know, right in the teeth. Uh, and there's industries in our, in our state particularly in places like Atlanta County with gaming. I think Atlanta County has had the hardest economic impact of any county in America uh, from COVID. It's, it's pretty concentrated industry and an industry that was pretty hit pretty hard um, um, by this uh, by this pandemic. So we've got some weak spots, but I think we also, to Julia's point earlier, I think you know renewable energy, clean energy, there's a lot of reasons to be excited and optimistic that have been either on pause or making progress during the during the last year. So I think there's, you know, it's going to be, you know, gives and gets. And I think the balance will be more positive the further into the year we get. I think Kathy's projections on kind of full recovery are probably pretty right. The only variable I'd, I'd pop in there is two. One, are people going to come as soon as they can? Are people going to come right back to work in the office? I don't know. Uh, my guess is probably not exactly like they did before. But I think the narrative of everyone's going to work from home in perpetuity forever is a bit oversold. I think people thrive on human interaction. I know I for sure do. And I miss my colleagues and I miss having lunch and meeting people for a coffee and all that kind of stuff. That's that's good for my work life. Um, the second is what does Washington do? Uh, I think there's you know a, a, an impactful infrastructure oriented, uh, workforce oriented stimulus, clean energy oriented stimulus would would surely be helpful uh, to getting some longstanding projects uh, you know going to both support the trades and also support um, you know a, an array of different sectors. So I'm, again, I'm, I'm more optimistic today than I was a few months ago, but I think we're still in the middle of this. Uh, Joey Ortiz, talk about workforce development and, and both sides of the conversation we've had so far. What's been the impact over the past year on that sector? And what do you see as the outlook for this year? Thanks, Jared. It's good to see you. Um, yeah, it's time, you know, right now is, is both the time of crisis and opportunity for the sector. Uh, as we all well know uh, too well, uh, you know, one million plus New Yorkers lost their jobs and those jobs uh, impact, job losses impacted workers across socioeconomic experience and educational attainment. And those losses disproportionately impacted women, people of color, immigrants, and historically marginalized communities. Many of these New Yorkers are from communities that would historically benefit from the workforce development system. Uh, and many other folks are essential workers uh, and doing jobs on the front lines to keep us safe. Uh, far too many got sick as a result of the pandemic and are dealing with that and we're dealing with that aftermath. Um, and because of these facts, the workforce development community and the human services sector sprung into action uh, to provide immediate relief for New Yorkers. Um, as we think about the recovery, the sector is especially thinking about long-term systemic changes that we can implement. Um, you know, going back to normal, many of folks have said it, it's just, it, we can't do that. It's just not enough. Uh, back to normal for for many means low wages, uh, poor job quality, and economic security. And so it's promising to hear, uh, you know, what is potentially coming down the pike from the federal government. And obviously, 
uh, the great news uh, uh, had recently in, in, with the state and Cuomo's announcements. Uh, but we need to ensure that New Yorkers are set up for future stability and success. And I think this is a, a, a space where we can see that potentially happen. So let's talk about uh, another crisis that I think the city has been confronting for a while and it might be part of the picture sooner than we'd like to think, which is climate change. Uh, talk about your sectors and how climate change presents itself as obviously potentially a challenge, but I'm sure for some of you an opportunity. Uh, we kind of want to take inventory of all the problems we have and then we'll talk later about uh, what, what government should do about them. But um, Kathy, let's start with you. Climate change in the city, obviously a lot of different effects. Does anything jump out for you as um, your, your biggest concern or hope regarding that threat? Well, the, the biggest concern, and I was interested to hear the previous speaker describe with, with great clarity the, the level of the threat, um, is as 500 miles of waterfront in New York City. And, and so that affects so many communities in such dramatic ways. And we really don't, uh, we don't have a comprehensive plan for how we're gonna deal with it. We've, we've made some efforts to develop uh, ideas, but we don't have funding for most of those. So, so I would say it's, uh, it's our waterfront, the topic of the Alliance that, is, uh, that we have to look at and figure out. I, I both live and work in, a, in an area that's gonna disappear in a few decades if we don't do something. So, um, so I, I think that's the that's the big that's the big challenge. I think there are a lot of interesting solutions on the technology side, particularly with clean buildings, um, that are uh, are becoming available and being implemented. And I think the leadership that our uh, utility companies are taking, both Con Ed and National Grid, in figuring out how they can contribute to uh, accelerating the controls on carbon are very important and that those are important partnerships to cultivate. So I think we have real opportunities for industry to work with organizations in the environmental area and like the Waterfront Alliance and, uh, and with the broader private sector to make sure that we're resilient and that our buildings are, uh, are behaving themselves. John Nardi, how about for you, climate change? Uh, what, what kind of problems does that pose? What opportunities does it open? Yes, yeah, so I mean, our members' uh, facilities are on the waterfront. So, uh, you know, it's, this is an issue that's very important to us. Uh, we, from a vessel perspective, it's really be, being looked at on a global basis uh, because you, you know, it's, it's, it would be impossible to come up with standards, you know, for each individual port and then live up to those standards. So the International Maritime Organization has been uh, addressing that. Uh, I think Los Angeles and Long Beach have come up with, you know, they, they've sort of been the leaders in a lot of this, uh, a lot of the uh, environmental issues when it comes to vessels, when it comes to plug-in, um, running vessels on electricity instead of on uh, fossil fuels in the port. Um, but there's also a move to move vessels to uh, LNG, which would make some of those uh, technologies obsolete in the very short term. So it's difficult to invest in, you know, in something that's going to be obsolete in, in the short term. On the terminal operator side, you know, the machinery is becoming more electrified. Uh, the technology is improving. We're working closely with, um, you know, New Jersey DEP, and they're protecting against climate threats program. And, um, you know, so it's, you know, we are actively involved in, in all measures to try and ensure that the port industry is, you know, is not contributing to, uh, you know, a negative situation going forward because uh, our, our livelihood or our existence depends on it. Uh, Tim, since you work in New Jersey, which for some of us here in the city, we refer to as the Western United States, uh, I want to ask you about the, the, the re potential for regional work on the climate issue and, you know, how necessary you think that is and, and whether there's much prospect for that in terms of um, efforts to reduce emissions, but also to show up resiliency, especially as regards uh, the waterfront. Do you, has there been much good work on that? And do you see any prospects for continued regional work on environmental stuff? Yeah, we often refer to the five boroughs as part of greater New Jersey. So uh, I appreciate the sentiment. Um, touche, touche. <laughs> um, you yeah, know, I, I think the climate, 
New Jersey is a, a you know big important state in some regards, but also geographically quite small. Um, this has to be a regional solution. We were really proud to rejoin uh, the regional greenhouse gas initiative in the early days of Governor Murphy's time in office, which had been we dropped out of under the previous administration. Now Virginia's in other places. That that creates that's both good for the environment and the air quality, which is great, but also creates money to invest in resilience and invest in the grid and invest in uh, smart uh, clean clean energy and. and um, the smart initiatives around around this ambition. So that's got to be critical. Um, I would say the collaboration between at least uh, principally New York and New Jersey has been has been pretty good on the stuff we we're, on offshore wind. I think we're, our motto has been uh, collaborate where we need to and compete where it's appropriate. Um, it's good for New Jersey's offshore wind ambitions that New York is making progress on its offshore wind ambitions and vice versa. The, the density of the sector, the stability of that emerging sector is really important to everyone. So great news yesterday out of New York State. And congrats to Julia and the team at Equinor. And, Congrats to Governor Cuomo and his great team on all this. That, that, that's good for us. We'll compete on who gets the supply chain, and we'd like to get more of our fair share than New York will get, but that's just the ordinary kind of push and pull of um, economic development. But I think on the, on the sort of the regulatory and the big policy questions, I think the, the, those two states and really the region um, have been partnering well, but it's, and I don't mean to cop out and put everything on DC, national leadership is going to be critical on this. And thankfully, we've got, you know, administration coming in that's got uh, obviously, this is a high priority, uh, both with the appointments it's made and the policy commitments it's made, uh, or that the president-elect has made, um, that I think is really important. That's that's critical to getting those offshore wind projects going as well. We want to have an interior department that's aligned with smart development of the, of the coastline, off the coastline. Uh, we want to have a you know appropriate engagement with, with the environmental stakeholders on all that. Um, but having an, or, an, an orientation that is pro-renewables as opposed to Let's go with tolerable, tolerating renewables uh, is, is going to be really important. So uh, Joey and Julia and Carlo, I, I, I don't mean to be glib when I say that I think, well, for all of us, climate change poses a real human threat. For the sectors you all represent, there also are obvious uh, opportunities uh, in terms of, of workforce and wind and, and construction. I'm curious, what do you see those opportunities as and what do you identify as like the chief obstacle right now to achieving them. Uh, Joey, why don't we start with you from the workforce development angle? Yeah, I, I think, um, you know, right now, I think what we're dealing with largely within the sector is, you know, what we've already seen as a, a growing trend prior to COVID. And that's really the automation and digitalization of businesses at large. Um, so, you know, for example, you know, fast food uh, franchises and retail stores shut their doors for a period of time. But when they reopened, they were incentivized to replace uh, human cashiers with kiosks and, and, uh, and in the name of both health and safety, cutting overhead costs. Uh, so many of these jobs, as we've already talked about, don't exist anymore. And to your point, while this is unfortunate, it also presents an opportunity, but a big challenge to upskill and reskill workers in the new industries. Uh, and green jobs are, are an opportunity there. Uh, so you know, certainly organizations like uh, Non-Traditional Employment for Women, DC 37, the whole program, Green City Four, Sustainable South Bronx, Building Skills New York City, lots of other organizations uh, are already working right now to train people. And then you have organizations like Perscolis and Knowledge House and Empower in Europe that are training folks in the tech space that largely impact this uh, area as well. Um, so there's a real opportunity to expand these models and other models to build a workforce. Um, but we, you know, we need uh, to the earlier point, we need funding um, and that needs to grow and needs to come down the pike from uh, um, the federal government and from state leaders as well in order to really build this 21st century workforce that we're going to need um, because it just simply doesn't exist in the way that we're going to need it over the next 10 years and decades to come. Julia, how about you? How do you see it? Well, you know, thinking about sea level rise as we've discussed in this last hour, it's, it's this sort of funny cyclical thing, irony really, where you know it was announced yesterday that we're spending $600 million on two new ports for New York. It's a combination of funding from the city, the state, Equinor, and our partners. But all of these facilities are gonna be in the most vulnerable place for sea level rise. So we're gonna build them higher than, uh, than normal. I live right next to Brooklyn Bridge Park. It's, uh, now we have this incredible park in Brooklyn on the waterfront and it could be underwater, or, and it is underwater more frequently and, and because of sea level rise. So whether it's offshore wind or just some of the really nice redevelopment we've done on the urban waterfront, um, it, uh, it's, it's suddenly you know, really becoming apparent how vulnerable it is. And we can build a lot of offshore wind, we can get a lot of the carbon, 
um, out of our electric system. Equinor is very much in favor of greater electrification of uh, everything from shore power for boats to larger transportation goals. But um, the, the mitigation aspect is something that, that we haven't really been hearing about so much in the last few years. And uh, that's certainly the, the flip side of it. We wanna build a lot of offshore wind for New York and for the world really. But um, if our ports are underwater, it's gonna be hard. To say the least. Uh, Carlo, what does it mean for, uh, for your sector? Is it uh, all good news? Lots of work to be done in terms of retrofits and stuff or are there challenges too? Look, I think a lot of it is good news for uh, employers getting people to work, but I think Jose, you really hit the nail on the head. If we don't have a trained workforce that can go out and really do the, the work that's needed, uh, clearly we're gonna be behind. I think also government uh, needs to understand that technology and innovation um, need to really become the forefront of everything we do. Uh, New York is ahead in many things, but we are not ahead in a lot of innovative building techniques that are going on in China, in Germany, in other places across the world. So I think as we learn about what's next, understanding best practices from other countries uh, is critical. Understanding that everything, I think Julia, you bring up a great point about Brooklyn Bridge Park. I know Tim knows that park very well, having worked on it for many years. Um, but Kathy and I sat on a BQE redevelopment panel. And one of the things we talked about was, as you think about rebuilding the BQE, which happens to run along the waterfront, basically, uh, uh, for sure in Brooklyn and parts of Queens, um, you have to really think about how are you gonna build it to be sustainable when you know the waters are rising and you know everything that is going on. So I think thinking futuristic but building today is something we have to get together. Because this is no longer a problem of the future. It's a problem of yesterday that we're trying to solve today. So I think innovation, best practices, workforce training, and then honestly, my members will have a lot of work in it. Carlo, let's stay with you because let's turn to that question of government and, and you know, talking about any level you want, city, state, federal, all of the above. How does government encourage that kind of innovation or the adoption of best practices? What are policies that would lend themselves to doing that? Well, look, I think you have to bring the private sector in. You have to let the private sector be part of the discussion. Um, you know, if the private sector has some great ideas, whether it's on how to develop better, greener, quicker, uh, how to develop uh, better workforce programs and training, and let the business community and the private sector help you build that out. Um, don't let the private sector come in when a bill has already been crafted and written. Uh, don't let the private sector, particularly on workforce development issues, and I think Jose, you can talk about this even further, don't let them come in when you've already created the panels and, and the laws, and then say, hey, what do you think about this? It can't work that way anymore. And then I think government, in many ways needs to look elsewhere. And, and I use China and Germany and, and other countries that have figured out drones, have figured out uh, building in places where there is major climate issues, where there are mountainous regions. I mean, there's so many examples. Um, how do we learn from what's happening? And government has to allow itself to open up and learn from other places. So we've got the near and present challenge of recovering from COVID-19 and its economic devastation. Then we have this climate crisis that's hanging over our heads. Um, a lot for private sector and government to deal with. Um, Kathy, we know we're going to lose you in a few minutes, so I want to get your voice on this. What do you think are the most meaningful things that a Biden administration can do to help New York City navigate all of these crises or, or perhaps the ones that you find are the most highest priority? Well, what I'd like to see is an urban policy that we haven't really had since the 1970s. And our metro regions, our urban metro regions, are the high growth sector and the high economic output sector of this country. And we've paid no attention to providing them with an organized source of comprehensive support. So I don't think it's 
uh, just affordable housing, or it's just mass transit, or it's just the, uh, the shoreline resiliency issues. I think it's a really clear understanding uh, that varies from what we've had in the last four years. We've really had sort of an attack on cities, whether it was on sanctuary cities or on cities that uh, are blue cities or whatever. But I think we've got a, an opportunity now to create a, a different attitude towards cities as this country's most important resource, both for economic growth and for the delivery of human services, for community health purposes. We got to bring those pieces together. And we're very lucky in New York that we, uh, as, as was referenced earlier, we've got the sectors, every sector, uh, the nonprofit, the university sector, the cultural sector, the business, each of the various business sectors, they are working together to come up with public policy. We've spent too much time waiting for city government to find the answers in the past few years or for, uh, for government generally to find the answers. I think that the COVID has given communities of interest, the opportunity to come together and resurrect the way we rebuilt the city in the 1980s, which was from the ground up and with the ideas and the impetus coming from the communities. And I think that's going to be very important going forward. And I think if we can get the Biden administration to have policies that reach into the communities of the city, that's really going to make a difference for us. So we're coming, uh, unfortunately, very close to the end of our time. We only have a few minutes left, and I've promised to get some audience questions in. So I want to have everyone have a chance to weigh in on this question of government action. But we have to do this like one of those lightning rounds they do in debates. So uh, for those who haven't weighed in yet, uh, Julia, John, Tim, and Jose, tell me one, one thing, one or two things you want to see in the next six months from Washington or Albany or City Hall that you think will address all of these needs we've talked about today. Uh, Joey, why don't we start with you? One or two things, Jared. That, I mean, that's that's uh, it. That's the wish list. <laughs> I mean, uh, something that was uh, already raised, I think, is really important um, outside of the training specific area, but it, but is connected, um, is uh, digital poverty. Uh, the digital divide is huge, and people who weren't able to uh, have uh, broadband access or hardware access and software uh, essentials in order to work and earn and learn from home uh, uh, were really left out um, or immediately dropped off as a result of the pandemic. So we really need to make sure that people are, are hardwired in. We also need to really address the fact that uh, women are falling out of the workforce more rapidly than others. And uh, that is a result because of women you know, stepping up and taking care of loved ones who are sick and caring for children that are now virtually learning. Um, so uh, we need to make sure that child care infrastructure is built up uh, significantly uh, as we uh, work towards reskilling and upskilling folks for this new workforce. Julia, how about for you? Expedited yet responsible permitting. We have hundreds of millions of dollars we want to spend now to rebuild these ports, but we can't do it until we get the permits. And, you know, we're willing to do the most environmentally responsible work uh, that, uh, that one can do. But sometimes permitting things and in the greater New York, New Jersey area um, can really suck the wind out of a lot of, uh, of good things. So I really hope that we can get these ports permitted quickly. Good one. Tim. I agree with all those things. I think Kathy mentioned this earlier, uh, state and local aid in the next stimulus bill. We got, we got budget problems all over the region. Uh, the recovery and the ability to do the workforce things that Jose was talking about, the infrastructure things that John's been talking about and that Carla's been talking about, critical that our governments just don't fall down and, and have to make austere cuts to the safety net to government operations. We need state and local aid in the next uh, uh, round of stimulus. And John, how about for you? Well, I mean, to keep it really short term, and I guess it's been mentioned before, is we need to get the port workers vaccinated as soon as possible. Uh, they're pretty far down, you know, in some of the um, priorities mm -hmm. list, and we need to get those people moved up because if the supply chain shuts down, then, uh, you know, nobody's going to have the goods that they need. And from D.C., you know, there's some bills sitting there that uh, we need appropriations for that are going to pay for some of all these safeguards that we've been, you know, spending, you know, billions of dollars on on a, on a countrywide basis. So, so um, you know, th those are the, sh the short-term uh, needs in, uh, in our business right now. So we're going to turn to audience questions now, uh, as promised. And the first one actually comes for you, John. Uh, it's a question about the fact that we've seen some bankruptcies um, in petroleum carriers, uh, in part because people are driving less, using less fuel, I guess. How has that 
affected maritime traffic in the city and the region? Yeah, I, I'd really like to answer that, but none of my members are in the petroleum business. That's that's a separate uh, that's a separate entity. So I, I really have no um, you know no, no um, anything to add on that. Okay, interesting. Sorry. It's all right. Uh, uh, Julia and, and Jose, this question is for you. Um, let's get specific about the, the types of jobs there are shortages in and the types of training people would need to, to get there. What, what do we actually need to, to start uh, inculcating? Uh, Julia, start with you. What are the specifics that we need to let people get into your industry? Well, I think we have just about the best construction workforce you could imagine uh, in, in New York City, in New Jersey. You know, we, we have people who can build these projects in our workforce the same way they build skyscrapers and incredible bridges and tunnels. Um, but we have been a couple of generations, with the exception of uh, you know John and his members, a lot of the workforce is a couple generations removed from really working on the water and in the water, being at sea. Um, and that's in some ways even more cultural. So, you know, Equinor and our partners plan to be out in high schools and, you know, talking to the people who in five years we hope will hire to, to run our projects and operate our projects about what it would mean to have a career where you're really on a boat um, a lot of the time. And it's exciting prospect, right? Joey? Yeah, just to, to add to that, I think everything she said is, is correct, but I think we need to build this earlier into our educational system as well as into the workforce system there th there's just too much of a gap that currently exists in terms of this training directly to the existing uh, um, employment opportunities uh, and so with that it requires a big leap from the existing opportunities to then growing into these new climate resilient jobs and so um, we just we need to really connect more effectively uh, the education and workforce development system to these employers and so we you know definitely need the government to respond to that, but we also need the businesses to work uh, more hand in hand with these these institutions in an effort to make sure that we are ready to deploy folks. Kathy touched earlier on the idea of some a, a ground up approach to solving and addressing some of these problems. Um, you know, ideas coming from communities. Uh, anybody seeing any particularly interesting, innovative ideas from businesses, neighborhoods, nonprofits? you know, stuff that uh, the government should pay more attention to? Any specifics on that front? Yeah, I, I can jump in for a second. I mean, we, we just recently uh, launched an initiative uh, in partnership with the Association for Neighborhood Housing Development and Regional Plan Association. Um, this effort is called the New York City Inclusive and Growth Initiative, uh, which is meant to develop an agenda here in New York City that adds jobs, retains, and expands affordable housing and drives the economy forward. Uh, so we're actively right now putting together a steering committee that's representative of what we believe is the diversity that is in New York City. Uh, and that's in terms of race, ethnicity, gender, sexuality, immigration, history and status, disability and accessibilities, and overall thought. And uh, our goal is for the initiative to proactively uh, um, include people of all uh, different educational attainments and, and civic influence in order to really build what we think is uh, a more uh, inclusive agenda here that's anchored on economic development, workforce development, and housing. Uh, and so um, if there are other initiatives like that that exist in terms of you know, diversity, but the goal here is really to take a more holistic approach to bringing in uh, the things that are important to people and, and important to business uh, and communities. And, uh, and we're hopeful that we can uh, create some new innovative ideas on how to address some of these needs. One of the things that kind of strikes me uh, just in the few minutes we have left about both the big problems we've talked about today, the pandemic and climate change is, you know, how huge they are. Uh, they seem inexorable. You feel kind of powerless in the face of them. Obviously, we're all individuals and the people who are tuning in uh, represent individual people or businesses. Um, I, I love some ideas for what you would suggest people do who want to be a positive part of crafting the cities and the regions uh, navigating out of these crises and preparing for the, the climate one. Um, any suggestions to people who are tuning in? What, what can folks do to try to be part of the solution or at least part of the conversation? Well, one thing I would say is to be open to ideas and to not just say no to everything um, because we happen to be living in a time where there's a lot of no out there. Um, and something may be a great project, there may be a long process, but people already start with, no, we can't do it, or no, we don't want it, or no, 
were opposed to it even before they understand that it can be something really good for the community, the borough, the city, the nation. I think that's really, really important. So I, I would be a, let's start saying yes to things as opposed to no. Good one, positive attitude. Anyone else? I think there's a lot been going on with uh, restaurants cooking for first it was the healthcare workers that were working and then providing food and meals uh, through the city's food network and on their own. There, there, there have been a lot of person to person responses that uh, don't necessarily represent anything institutionalized. It's been very spontaneous. And I think it's a matter of taking a look at that, creating cross sector leadership networks so that the folks who are on the ground with energy and support that are working in to meet some of these most serious needs are connected to resources. So similar to what we've done with the city with the Small Business Resource Network and the Chambers of Commerce, I think we should be doing that in other areas. Arts and culture is one where there's a couple of groups. One is NYC Next, uh, that is a group of volunteers, again, who are trying to give a couple hundred bucks to artists, musicians who uh, have pop-up performances. Uh, those kind of efforts have been spontaneous. I think we've got to translate that into ongoing, uh, ongoing support networks for the, those groups. In New York, your best strategic partner can live next door to you and you will never meet them. So I think the job is one of communications and messaging and trying to figure out what are the, what's the infrastructure look like that, where we can put these uh, resources, volunteers, creative people together uh, to, uh, to help each other get things done for New York. Because New Yorkers are going to save New York from the COVID. Well, I just want to note, as folks might have seen in the chat, another way you can get involved specifically in the resilience efforts and conversation about how to protect the city and the region against climate change. The website rise to resilience.org is a good place to go. That's the number two. So www.rise to resilience.org. Uh, I want to thank the Alliance for having me on. I want to thank all of you, Julia and John, Joey, Catherine, Carlo and Tim for being part of this excellent panel. I learned a lot. And now it's my pleasure to turn it over to Courtney to talk about uh, the Waterfront and Resilience Merrill platform. Courtney, thank you. Well, Jared, thank you so much. You did an amazing job and we're just really happy to have had you here today. And thanks to all of our panelists. So we're gonna wrap this up. This was a great day. Thank you all for being with us. There's, there are two things though I really want you to leave with that are really important. We're talking about grassroots. We're talking about work for the public and common good. So I'm here to tell you a little bit about how you can get involved with that. So the Waterfront Alliance is taking on an incredibly important initiative this year. 2021 is the critical local election year for New York City. More than 10 candidates are in the mix to become the next mayor of New York City. The next mayor for New York must lead and embrace the bold solutions and the things that we've talked about today and even more, more so than any mayor in the history of New York City. So today we're launching the Waterfront Alliance's Resiliency Platform. So in the link, you'll find a chat to this and it's also on our website, make sure to check it out. So a just and equitable recovery for our region really depends on the New York, New Jersey Harbor and Waterfront. You've heard about that today. It is absolutely true. We have to make sure that our, the next leadership for New York City, that our elected officials make the harbor and the waterfront a part and a high part and a priority part of their agendas. So that's the purpose of this platform. So if we go to the next slide, the four priorities of the Waterfront Alliance mayoral platform are that the harbor is central to the economy and the regional recovery that we need, that the climate is changing and so should our waterfronts, that access to the waterfront is key to breaking down physical and social barriers at the water's edge. And lastly, that our port and maritime sector is a 21st century economic driver and key to renewable energy. So if we go to, these, to the next slide, I'm here to tell you to get involved. These priorities will only become priorities for New York City 
if you get involved with us and others who are working on similar issue, issues, including the Rise to Resilience Coalition. And one of the most important things that you can do is encourage your favorite candidate for mayor to adopt this platform. Please send this platform to the mayor that you are standing behind, to, sorry, please send this platform to the candidate for mayor that you're standing behind at this point. Or send them to all of them if you're undecided. The next thing you need to do is encourage your candidate to respond to the questionnaire that the Waterfront Alliance will be posing to all candidates for mayor in the next few weeks. And again, if you are unsure who you're supporting, please make sure to just broadcast this opportunity to as many of the candidates as possible. It's really important that they respond to this questionnaire. We'll be posting the results of this in, in February. And then the next major uh, way to get involved is at our conference in May. So the Waterfront Alliance Conference will hold a, a, a town hall for all of the candidates for mayor at this event. So this is gonna be a really important three-day conference and we really hope you guys will join us. And um, it, should be, it should be important and in terms of continuing the conversations that we've been having today. But related to the mayoral platform, it's where we're gonna hear from all the candidates for mayor and their commitment to, to the harbor and the waterfront. So with that, I will wrap it up. And I just wanna thank everyone again for joining us. Please get involved. If you have any questions at all for the Waterfront Alliance or for my team, please post them in the chat. We'll leave it up for a little while. The conference again, the dates for the conference, which I should have mentioned are May 10th, uh, 12th and 14th. It will be a virtual event. Thank you all so much.